Good evening. Welcome to the March 25th, 2019 meeting of the Moorhead City Council. We'll call the meeting to order. It is approximately 5.30 p.m. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, may we re receive a roll call? Shelly Dahlquist. Here. Sarah Watson Curry. Here. Shelly Carlson. Here. Heidi Durand. Here. Joel Paulson. Here. Deb White. Here. Steve Gertz. Chuck Henriksen. Here. And Mayor Jonathan Judd. Here. May we all rise and recite the Pledge of, of Allegiance. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Number three on the agenda <clears throat> are agenda amendments. Are there any amendments to the agenda this evening? Um, Mr. Mayor, City Council, item number 17 has been requested to be put on consent agenda about the um, final design for the wastewater um, facility plan. It's been asked to be put on consent. That being said, is there a motion to approve the agenda with the amendment as stated by Madam Volkers? So moved. Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. Moved by White. Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Hendrickson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <clears throat> Item number four, consent agenda. Items that are marked with an asterisk are listed on the consent agenda and will be adopted with one motion. However, is there any, if there are any council members who are requesting any matter to be pulled off at this time, uh, we can discuss that and pull that, but I assume we all <laughs> are good with the consent agenda as stated. Motion moved to approve by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member Watson Curry. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <clears throat> Number five, recognitions and presentations. Dr. Nope. Excuse, Excuse me. Moore. Thank you. Good evening, I'm here to brief our sandbag operations plan for the upcoming event. <clears throat> the location for our sandbag operations center, or SOC, that is the phrase coined, it's not sandbag central, it is the SOC. <laughs> it's located at Moorhead Schools Operations Center at 1313 30th Avenue South, which is the former Muscatel facility. Our goal is 150,000 sandbags, which uh, puts us at a daily production goal of 20,000 sandbags. And our minimum requirement or optimum requirement for volunteers at any one given time is 50. And I'll go into further detail on that. Here's our layout of, of the uh, sandbag operations. And this just highlights where volunteer parking is off of 30th Avenue. And we'll have a Red Cross trailer uh, located on the outside. Um, volunteer check-in, check-out stations, and where we'll be assembling the sandbags inside. And that's just the overall layout of the site. And there's two areas that we rope off. The school was kind enough to give us the entire west side, and they moved all their bus operations to the, to the east side. So we'll have all that parking area will be open for our volunteers. The internal layout of the SOC itself is like this. I won't go into... Uh, excruciating detail um, but this is how it'll be laid out we're laying it out right now we might have some alterations uh, we might have to flex a little bit based on interior space so essentially we're gonna have three sandbag machines and then a cone filling station uh, to augment those sandbag <coughs> filling machines volunteer this is a layout of personnel so personnel will come in the north side of the building and we'll have uh, those X's designate the optimum number of volunteers for for uh, filling operations. The green hexagons are city staff that will be providing oversight and uh, make sure the supplies are, uh, are available so we can keep operations going. 
concept of operations or con ops. We'll have, uh, won't go into to detail there, but uh, you know, we'll keep constant supply of sand inside and, um, and we'll be zip tying those bags and then placing them in roll off containers. They'll hold about 800 and then we'll move those in and out and um, it'll be good there. We'll have a contractor run the payloader and skid steer and we're gonna, hold, we're gonna conduct roll off operations internally. We have 40 roll off containers, which gives us a total capacity of 32,000. And um, we'll have five or six city employees, like I said before, monitoring the sock at all times. Sandbag storage. The bags will be filled in those roll off containers and then our primary uh, storage location will be on 28th Street North, which is the Richards Transportation Building across from the wastewater treatment plant. That puts most of the assets in the north near zone one where they'll be deployed. Um, so that's why we're uh, gonna store them up there. Additional storage if needed, uh, we located uh, an area at Oberg Farms in Glendon. You ask, well, that's kind of a far uh, ways away to store sandbags, but uh, we're hoping that we can get most of them mm -hmm. in Richard's transportation, then we'll leave the rest in the roll-offs and not have to use that Glendon area. But uh, the good news is, there was not a lot of storage space available because it's all being used. The bad news is there was no storage space available. Mm -hmm. So we had to, it took us a while to find it, but many thanks to Richard's Transportation and Oberg Farms for being there for us. Volunteers may be needed in the storage areas to reload uh, sandbags from that storage area, uh, but uh, we'll work that concurrently depending on what we have to deploy into the field as far as sandbags. Sandbag deployment, those assets will be requested by the zone leaders, so when they, they'll call logistics, uh, we're working out those details on communication, but they'll call and make a request, we'll know exactly how many sandbags to deliver and that delivery location and we'll work delivery and volunteers at the on-site location. And we're working that deployment schedule concurrently with uh, while we're producing the sandbags. Resource requirements, this is a list of resources. Uh, to do 150,000 uh, sandbags, we need about 4,000 tons of sand. We have 1,500 to 2,000 tons on site right now, it just delivered today. We're gonna hold there, see how production goes, and then determine whether uh, we'll need that second delivery for the remainder of the sand. Sock imp implementation timeline, we're setting up the sock right now. Those checklist items are complete. We got the barricade set up. We had to remove snow from the primary sand storage location. That's complete. And uh, we're in the process of stockpiling the empty sandbags and zip ties. Um, sandbag machines and empty roll-offs are being delivered. And that'll be complete tomorrow. And we'll place signage for parking, signage for where volunteers will enter the facility. And we're also setting up that secondary uh, cone sandbag area. And those items are complete and then the SOC schedule. We'll do an internal test run tomorrow to see uh, how everything's set up and if it flows okay. That'll be uh, taking place at 2 p.m. tomorrow and then we'll full operations will commence starting Wednesday at, zero, at 9 a.m. Uh, and we'll end uh, first four days. We'll be doing Wednesday through Saturday from 9 to 9 and then uh, from 12 to 9 on Sunday and then Monday through Wednesday the following week, 9 to 9 if needed. And we'll gauge those requirements mm -hmm. as we uh, get a handle on how much uh, we're producing every day. All this is great, but you can't do it without volunteers. So we need volunteers. Um, you can register online for one or more two hour shifts. They talk me down from 12 hour shifts. <laughs> so two hour shifts they say are ideal. Um, and the groups of volunteers are especially encouraged to register in advance. And if you don't have internet, we can call, call the call center and sign up at 218-299-5300 during regular business hours. Um, with that map, that map will be posted so volunteers come off of 30th Avenue, park on that west side of the building, and you'll see signage to go through the door. We'll have police volunteers signing folks in and out so we can, for accountability, the volunteers will receive a quick safety briefing and then uh, a briefing on where their workstation will be and get them to work. And volunteers must sign a waiver. And here's an outline. Uh, those, those volunteers that are 14 through 17 can work independently with a signed waiver. 
Um, high school is going to step up and provide some, some bodies, I think. And then volunteers 13 and under must be accompanied by a parent or a guardian. And then each registered volunteer will wear wristbands so we know that they've been in processed and so we know they're <coughs> there and we're tracking the volunteers for any reimbursement that may come in the future. Additional details, check out the city website at cityofmoorhead.com slash flood. And there's, it'll have some uh, information regarding uh, MAP bus transportation, what to wear, and uh, Red Cross and Salvation Army will provide water and refreshments during operations. And with that, I'll entertain any questions. Council Member White. Just happened to be down there going to my dentist today and I noticed there's a detour, so will that be taken care of before we start? No, that's okay. a meal. There is a detour on 30th Avenue, so it's best to approach from 20th Street. Okay. Any other uh, questions for Mr. Moore? And just for <clears throat> a point of clarification, uh, the reason why we were giggling up here is because uh, uh, Steve Moore uh, is a veteran and has served our country admirably. However, he's introducing us to some new military jargon. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when I saw, what was it again? Uh, Conops. Yes. Oh, and sock. Wow. So we're going to have to get used to some of this jargon moving on. So we're just having a giggle about that. So thank you, Mr. Moore. For All that. right. Thank you. <laughs> we'll move on to uh, letter B under uh, number five, which is the presentation of police officers <clears throat> who have successfully completed the city of Moorhead Police Department field training program, newly promoted supervisory and command staff and also a life-saving award. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm very proud to introduce you to um, some of our new officers and uh, the, the promotions that have taken place. Some of these have gone you know, back into late uh, 2018 or so when some of this was taking place, but we're finally uh, able to get in front of you here today. And uh, we had a ceremony at the police department today, which was a badge pinning. It's kind of a nice time for, uh, for families. So I think I'm going to term that the bat pin now, so if I can follow Steve <laughs> Moore's lead. <clears throat> um, as you can see, I got, uh, come on up here, Adam. Uh, we've already injured Adam in his first few months. <laughs> um, <laughs> He was out looking for a, a missing child one evening when it was really icy and fell and uh, broke his ankle. So he uh, he's only had to polish one boot for tonight. <laughs> um, Adam began at MPD on uh, February 12th of 2018 and graduated from the field training program on June 13th of 2018. He started here initially as a parking enforcement officer before becoming a police officer. Uh, Adam was born in Iowa but moved to Sox Center, Minnesota when he was four years old. He has three siblings, a brother, and two sisters. He graduated from Sox Center High School, and I'm sure it's no shock to you that uh, he played basketball um, and football. Um, Adam attended Minnesota State University Moorhead, earning his bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Um, Adam enjoys uh, time hunting, fishing, and snowmobiling, so he's an outdoorsman, and he's laid up here a little bit right now. Um, since joining Moorhead PD, um, he enjoys working as a patrol officer, and he just recently got married here in September of 2018, and they are in the process of purchasing a home here in Moorhead. So okay. welcome, Adam Jensen. So. Next to have Amanda Mose. Amanda uh, began with MPD on May 7th of 2018 and graduated field training on September 18th of 2018. She's originally from Fargo, having graduated from Fargo South High School. Amanda also went to Minnesota State University Moorhead, earning her bachelor's degree in criminal justice. She attended Alexandria Technical College for Skills, and both her mom and dad still reside in the Fargo area here, along with two older brothers. Amanda is married to Roxanne, who's a logistics supervisor at DigiKey in Fargo. And Roxanne and Amanda have two dogs and enjoy camping and playing softball on some recreational teams. 
Um, Amanda came to us from the Cass County Jail where she um, worked as a corrections officer before coming over to um, Moorhead PD and she's been out on solo patrol already. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out with Amanda is uh, Moorhead has a couple of openings on the Red River Valley SWAT team right now and uh, Amanda and another newer officer Anastasia have put in for uh, those slots so we may have our first uh, women representatives on the SWAT team uh, depending on how it goes. This is Kyle Huey. Kyle began at MPD on September 17th, 2018 and graduated from the field training program on January 30th of 2019. He's originally from Bemidji, Minnesota, and he came to school here for three years before deciding to join the Army, serving with the 10th Mountain Infantry Division. After Kyle completed his service, he and his wife returned to Moorhead, and while back here, he got his degree in criminal justice from M-State. Um, I was one of the adjunct instructors there at the time and began recruiting him early on uh, when I recognized what a fine young man he was. Um, Kyle also attended his skills training at Alexandria Technical College and for him he is a very avid um, outdoorsman also enjoying uh, hunting and shooting sports and he uh, has been married to his wife Amanda since October of 2014 so please welcome Kyle. This is Joshua Kleckner. Um, Josh is a hometown Moorhead kid, so uh, we're ha very happy to have him here working in his hometown. He began at MPD on November 26, 2018 and graduated from the field training program on February 28th of 2019. Josh was born in California but moved to Moorhead at the age of six for the weather, right? Yeah. <laughs> he graduated from Moorhead High School and was active in sports. <clears throat> He attended M State for criminal justice and then Alexandria Technical College for his skills. Um, and he, like Adam Jensen, also started working at MPD initially as a parking enforcement officer um, before he uh, started here as a police officer. In between, though, uh, he spent a few years working for the East Grand Forks, Minnesota Police Department. And I believe he holds the record for the one to move through our training program the fastest ever in our history. So uh, from the time of hiring to hitting the street was very quick for us. Uh, obviously, East Grand Forks trains our officers very well as, all, as well. Um, He's married to his wife, Meg, and they have a German shepherd named Hank. And uh, what they like to do with their time off is they hit national parks around the country, and they do about two or three every year. So his hopes here uh, is a lot of community involvement. He wants to get involved with our Explorer Post, and also would like to try and get a position as a part-time um, football coach with Spuds Football. So welcome, Josh. One thing, if I may, that's uh, exceptional with Josh, uh, now that he's, he's walked away from here, is uh, in 2012 he was working at the North Fargo Sun Mart, mm -hmm. and uh, it was held up by an armed robber with a, carrying a rifle. And uh, they had just deposited the money, and Josh was um, concerned that this um, would-be robber was going to do something to them out of frustration, and he chose to spring into action. Uh, he grabbed the rifle, a struggle ensued over the rifle, and Josh was shot in the right arm and in the neck. The uh, robber fled from the store, and Josh ran out the front of the store with another cashier, and just by chance there happened to be a taxi cab out front, and Josh jumped in the taxi and got a ride to the hospital. So quite a man of action. He's been through a lot, and he still wanted to get into a career like this, and we're very happy to have him. So moving on to our promotions, um, some of you might recognize Joel Voxland. Um, Joel was promoted to sergeant. Uh, he began at MPD on April 14 of 2003, so he's just about to hit his 16th year with us. He was originally one of our police explorer kids before starting with the police department. He's another hometown uh, Moorhead kid. He attended 
St. Cloud State University, earning his bachelor's degree in criminal justice. He's held several positions with the department, including being an explorer advisor himself, working on bike patrol, field training officer, a SWAT operator, an active shooter instructor. He was a detective in the investigative division working on general case assignments um, and computer forensics investigations. He also is a SWAT negotiator and assistant team leader. He was promoted to sergeant on June 3rd of 2018. And if I may, so we had our badge pinning today and he had his daughters, Bria and Siri, pin on his badge. And I failed to mention that his wife, Tina, was sitting in the audience. <laughs> so if I can now, I'm on television, I'm hoping she's watching at home. I'm sorry, <laughs> Tina, for not mentioning you. It was my fault, not Joel's fault. So, okay, thank you. Next up, I'm sure a lot of you have met uh, Tory Jacobson before. He was promoted to uh, Deputy Chief of Police. Tory began at MPD on April 2nd of 1991. Um, he is just about to hit his 28th year here with us. And he's originally from Twin Valley, Minnesota. He's a graduate of Northland Community College where he earned his AAS degree in law enforcement, then went on to Minnesota State uh, University in Moorhead, earning his bachelor's degree in criminal justice. He's held several position, positions in the department, including a canine handler with his German Shepherd partner, Cody, a SWAT operator and assistant team leader. He was promoted to sergeant in 2000. Uh, he rotated through the investigative division as a detective sergeant working on general cases. And I like to point out that Tory um, put together the project of uh, tracking predatory offenders that uh, live in the city of Moorhead that has really served as an example throughout the state. Um, and Moorhead was recognized for the good job that we were doing and that was, that was Tory's work. He was promoted to um, lieutenant in 2006 and assigned to the administrative division where he did our public information officer stuff. So most of you probably saw him on TV often. Um, that position was reclassified in January of 2018 to captain, and then in September, um, he's been promoted to deputy chief. So, Tori Jacobson. <laughs> Got another injured one here, but this one did not happen <laughs> at work. Um, Derek is, uh, is our new captain. Uh, he began at MPD in November 13, 2000, um, so he's got 18 years in here now. He's originally from Barnesville, Minnesota. He's a graduate of Minnesota State University, Moorhead, earning his bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Mm -hmm. He began his public safety career as a paramedic with FM Ambulance after he completed his paramedic school. And he's currently enrolled at the University of San Diego in their graduate program in law enforcement and public safety leadership. Um, obviously, it's an online program because he's not traveling to and from there right now <laughs> for his courses. He's held several positions in the department, including a bike patrol officer. Uh, he was a DARE officer for us for a long time, SWAT negotiator and team leader, uh, peer assistance and mental health coordinator. He was promoted to sergeant in 2008, lieutenant in 2012. He's been the recipient of both a Life Saving Award and a Distinguished Service Award during his career. And in October 2018, he's been promoted to captain. So welcome, Derek. <laughs> this is Chris Martin. He was promoted to sergeant. Uh, Chris began at MPD on April 14, 2003, the same day as Joel Voxlin. So he is just hitting his 16th year here also. He's originally from Nevis, Minnesota, and he is a graduate of Minnesota State University, Moorhead. <laughs> <laughs> he earned his bachelor's degree there in criminal justice and sociology. He's held several positions with the department, including a bike patrol officer and instructor, the, uh, one of the explorer advisors, a field training officer, and he was a detective in uh, working in narcotics and uh, drug court for Clay Becker, one of the few drug courts around the state. Um, 
started here in the time that he was working um, as a narcotics detective and would attend the meetings regularly and working out who would likely be good people to bring into that program. So that could be a, so you spend a lot of time doing it and can be trying, um, but it's been a very successful program here in Clay County. He was promoted to sergeant in uh, November of 2018. Um, so this is Chris Martin. This is Joe Brannon. He's been promoted to sergeant. Joe began at MPD in September 22nd of 2008, so he's got uh, just about 10 years on here. He's originally from Duluth, Minnesota, but graduated high school um, from Hermantown. Uh, Joe, after high school, actually played one year of junior hockey with uh, Dubuque, Iowa, uh, before attending college. He graduated from Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College, earning his uh, Associate in Applied Science degree in law enforcement. He's held several positions in the department, including bike patrol, SWAT operator, uh, range master or firearms instructor, uh, field training officer, uh, the patrol officer's union steward, a force on force instructor, and he was our canine officer up until his promotion when his dog was retired. Um, his German Shepherd, German Shepherd for years? Yes, German Shepherd partner was Milo, and uh, he's now just a family pet at home. Um, Joe was promoted to sergeant on February 1 of 2019. So welcome, Joe. Uh, the last thing along presentations I have for you is a life-saving award. Um, Officer Zach Johnson is the recipient of the, the award, but he is on vacation, so he's not here right now. But I still think it's important for you guys to, to hear what happened here. Um, on June 8, 2018, at approximately 11 p.m., dispatch reported that a male called in and said he was about to enter the river. Officer Johnson and his trainee radioed to other officers that they had found the uh, missing person's shoes and personal belongings stacked by a rock near the river by the walkover bridge from the Woodlawn Park area into Fargo. Upon searching the area, a short time later, they saw the subject had traversed over the rapids of the Midtown Dam and his body was floating down the river. Officer Johnson's trainee entered into the river without concern for the lack of lighting, known footing, or the strength of the current of the river. He ended up entering about up to a, a waist level um, and retrieving the subject and drug him back to shore where Officer Johnson and his trainee began life-saving efforts when they found that the male did not have a pulse. After the administration of CPR, they recovered the victim's pulse and he began expressing river water from his lungs. He was identified by his items um, that they had found uh, on the shore and he was transported to Sanford Hospital in Fargo. Due to the heroic efforts of Officer Johnson and his trainee with their immediate action to start life-saving efforts, the victim survived. Officer Johnson's trainee um, is no longer with the department but he still will receive an award. Um, but for his actions on June 8th of 2018, the awards committee has awarded Officer Zach Johnson a life-saving award. Thank you. Thank you. Chief, Chief Monroe, before you leave. <clears throat> yep, that makes sure. Thank you. If anyone has any comments uh, for Chief Monroe, I just want to tell the people sitting here uh, and also the people at home that <clears throat> this is in essence is a celebration of what happens when community comes together. Uh, it's important for people to know that there is a common theme that most of these uh, officers graduated from MSUM or M State. They were former explorers and so we're growing our own. And I think that that's a really unique thing that we need to, to celebrate because it speaks volumes to what's going on in our community and our educational system. So kudos also to Dr. Powell, Dr. White, for the work that you all are doing to train our students, you know, well and obviously very successful in what they do. But I also think that it's a commonality that the, the individuals here are actively involved in our community. 
They have a vested interest in being successful in making our and keeping our community safe. And also, one final thought <clears throat> is that based on my education and, and experience in working with MPD, our FTO systems probably and arguably one of the toughest and hardest to get through in our state. So I think for people to understand sitting here and at home, this is a pretty big deal for these officers uh, to be standing here and being presented to us because it's a tough, <laughs> it's a really tough program, put it that way. So kudos to you, Chief, and your staff and your leadership for bringing these uh, officers here today. Thank, thank you, and thank you for mentioning the field training program because that, that they are crucial in getting them ready to work on their own so they do their jobs well and they do it safely. Absolutely. Mr. Mayor, one, one fun fact. Um, this is the first time ever that the police, that we know of, that the police department actually is fully staffed. Every single one of their positions has a person in it right now. They might not all be working because we have some injuries, but we have a, every person <laughs> is in a position, right? Or the other way around. Let's celebrate that. <laughs> Absolutely. I just, Councilor White. Uh, I, as you heard, one of the other hats I wear is as a faculty member in the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice, so I just couldn't be more proud of, you know, watching these students who worked so hard over the years and then seeing them really reach their goals of, you know, um, this is where many of them have wanted to be since they were young kids. And the other thing I wanted to say is part of what um, makes our program so strong, not just at MSUM but at M State, is because we have officers who teach in those programs and are mentoring that next group and so officer Detloff officer uh, Derek Swenson you know um, and I know you uh, chief you've taught you said at M State um, the you know the person who runs the program at, at M State is a former student and a former officer and it's really that willingness to go above and beyond you know all the work that you have going on during the day and then to give that service to those new uh, new folks that are coming into law enforcement it's um, really just says what kind of quality people you are so thank you Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Ooh, all right. That was pretty cool. So we'll move on to uh, 5C. Yep, Mr. Mayor, City Council. Um, we thought it was important to give you an overview of the Green Steps program, which is something that we're super proud of and we keep moving forward with um, for the City of Moorhead. So we've got Haley, I think is going to come up. Haley Hilfer is, um, has been our intern or sustainability um, um, employee partner in this effort and um, she's done so much great, so many great things and so much great work that I'm going to let Haley take it over. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm super excited to talk to you guys today. Sarah already knows this, but this is my third time ever speaking with a microphone, so I get really excited about this kind of stuff. Also, I get to talk to you about Green Step Cities. So, um, yeah, like she said, in my time here, I have been tasked with getting more ahead to a Step 3, Green Step Cities. And I know you guys have all probably heard a little bit about that, but I'm here to talk a little bit more about how Green Step Cities works and how we can move forward with it in the future. So... Okay, perfect. <laughs> oh, and I should let my colleague Scott introduce himself because he's I'm, been integral in making yes. this happen. So. so I've been working with Haley since October. I'm a Green Corps member with Minnesota. Um, so, yeah, we've been cruising along with this. So, yeah. excited to talk about it. <laughs> All right, so first off, I know you probably, like I said, know what this is, but I'll just give you a intro brief introduc introduction. So Minnesota Green Step Cities is a voluntary action-oriented program that Minnesota cities can get involved in to try and reach their sustainability development goals. And so this program is completely free of charge, which is one of the really great things about it, and it's exclusive to Minnesota at this point. And it has three overarching goals. Uh, first off, cost effectiveness. So a lot of sustainability development initi initiatives will end up saving money or bringing in money. Uh, civic innovation, you'll see later in the presentation, we have some examples of projects that have fit in the Green Steps framework that promote civic innovation. And also energy use reduction. So achieving measurable uh, reductions in energy use throughout the city. And so this is what I like to call my Minnesota Green Step Cities dream world. 
<laughs> um, so this is basically just a little illustration of everything that a Minnesota Green Step City would promote. Um, it would promote green buildings, renewable energy, walkable and bikeable communities, transportation options, local food, clean air and water, and ultimately the jobs that all of these things will end up bringing in. So there's a uh, 127 cities actually now taking action. One of them just joined was Dilworth, which is super cool. And I got get the opportunity to kind of help them. Um, they're at step one right now because they signed the resolution. I kind of get to help them go to step two, hopefully, by the time I'm done. Um, so there's five steps with Green Steps. Um, basically, the first one's just signing a resolution that you plan on doing Green Steps. Um, and then two is there's different categories for cities. Um, Moorhead's category A because of size and size of the city. Dilworth's category B and then there's category C. Depending on that, you uh, have to accomplish so much. So um, Moorhead's had accomplish implementing eight best practices, which we'll talk about later. Um, but then we were tasked with the, uh, you know, getting us as Moorhead to step three, which we've been working pretty hard on and we think we're pretty close to doing. Um, and then as you can see, you can get to step four and step five. And the idea of step four and step five is that you're constantly improving year after year, that you're never, uh, that you're never not getting more sustainable, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, there's 28 best practices in five categories. So there's quite a bit um, going on here. But first category is building and lightings. And basically under each category are these best practices which can help basically the city and us diagram how we can, you know, continually improve sustainability-wise. Um, there's also land use, transportation, environmental management, and community and economic development. So these are quality and life goals and sustainability goals. So they kind of range a huge platform here. So as you can see, like in those five categories, there's the 28 best practices, and that's what the language we've been using, but they're each a bullet point. And so as you can see, all of these best practices, those are 28 best practices, but these are each further broken down into what we call best practice actions. And so, for example, if you look under the transportation option, like for the, green, the complete green streets, best practice. It'll give you a variety of actions. And you have to complete so many of these actions in order to su successfully complete the best practice. And when you complete an action, you also get reviewed and it'll give you a star rating, one out of five. And then you can identify where you also can improve on the ones you've already started working on. So yes, best practice actions. And so I might note that Scott and I have mostly been tasked with detective work because Moorhead has done a lot of really great work that we just don't have in one place when it comes to sustainability. And so you can now see all of these actions that we're working on uh, for step three. You can see them on the Minnesota Green Step Cities website. And you can kind of see where we're at and where we can improve from there. So these are all projects that we can think about later on. Um, but we have a couple examples coming up here that you guys have already maybe heard of or worked on, and they're really great. Uh, so these are all things that fit within the Green Steps framework. Yeah, so hopefully you all know about Center Avenue being you know, <laughs> pretty far. But it's really cool because, yeah, like she said, we get to brag about what you have been doing already sustainability-wise. And then another cool thing is we get to brag to all Minnesota, all those 127 other cities, about what you're doing, what Mord's doing. Um, and you know, it takes us a lot of work, but it's nice to have it on the program. Um, so that's Center Avenue. So obviously the Mord River Corridor Plan. Um, basically, you saw before there's actions that we had to achieve, and a couple of them were high, high profile ones. We had to get to do step three. One of them was that um, green streets. So we completed that thanks to having complete street policy um, and thanks to identifying gaps as Metrocog did. Um, best practice, parks and trails, increase active lifestyles. I think Moore does a really good job at parks, so it was really easy to brag about that. So, and Moorhead's been on the 
ball with renewable energy. I think we've got three stars in this category because of how much we get from renewable power supplies. Um, so that's really cool to see. It's really, it's really cool to show off compared to all Minnesota, seeing how well more it's doing compared to other cities our size. So you can see that even like within Minnesota, Moorhead's doing well. And then another one is local air quality. And you guys probably have seen that high power charging station that's right outside Starbucks. So a lot of people can just stop, charge their car there. And a lot of people actually really do. I work at Starbucks, so I see a lot of people coming in for coffee when they're waiting for their car to charge. And it's really been used quite a bit, so very successful. And. Also, there's one on green business development, the best practice on green business development. And part of this is lowering the environmental and health risk footprint of a brownfield <laughs> remediation or redevelopment project. project. And Moorhead actually has a lot of these. I don't, this is crazy, because there's been a lot of good work on those. So the first slide you saw before was block E. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, I don't know if you guys know about the Kassenborg block. That was also a brownfield remediation site where they had to do a lot of environmental remediation in order to redevelop on that property. And the city of Moorhead helped out with that a lot with grant funding. And then, yeah, Kassenborg oh, Block. Nice, nice. <laughs> and then in the future, we have a couple more things to do to get to a, a step three. And one of those is to have a, basically an amendment in our purchasing policy for sustainable purchasing. And so we are currently working on that, getting employees to think about um, when they purchase a product for city use, the entire chain of what happens with that product from purchase to disposal. And then also B3 benchmarking. We're very close on this. This is just to track, we take all the utility bills for the city and we can track how much they cost, and then also how much each building uses. And we can use this to identify which buildings are the highest energy users, the highest water users, or the highest natural gas users. And we can take steps in the future uh, to mitigate their energy usage. So yeah, pretty awesome. We um, almost have that one done. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of data entry. Yeah. And after that, I will have you guys ask any questions, if you have any. Yes, Council Member White. I just wanted to know what we're doing to promote this. I think it's fantastic, and what are we doing to get the word out to let people know that Moorhead is taking such a leadership role in this area? Yeah, so we've presented a couple times now with this presentation to the Partnership for Health and then also to the Cass Clay Food Commission. So we take this presentation out and about a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but other than that, really, I'm looking for any excuse to talk about it because I get really nerdy about this. So <laughs> if you guys have a place for me to talk about it anymore, uh, yeah, suggestions, suggestions would be Excuse me. awesome. <laughs> thank yes. you. Yes. Taking over now. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you both for your work. It's really great. Like, your energy and enthusiasm for the project is really awesome. But um, you know, this information is available on the website. We were recognized um, at the League of Minnesota Cities at the annual conference statewide. And then it's part of, um, you know, it's really interesting. We've been invited to be part of the state fair <laughs> to share some of this information if we want. Um, yeah, yeah, we have. <laughs> Um, to help man a booth and may, you know, maybe a Moorhead day, you know, we'll see um, what your replacement wants to do. <laughs> and so we'll see uh, how that goes. But yeah, there's all kinds of opportunities to get the word out on this sort of, on this, this work. So. Great. Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Great work. I know we're at a two and we're climbing to three. Um, what's the time frame for that level three? Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so we just got like a, a basically a checkup report which tells us how many actions we have to complete to get there and the deadline for that is the first week in May, I believe. So hopefully we can get all of these completed by the first week in May and it's looking very optimistic for that. So, so how many May. steps were there to get to that? Um, well, we needed to complete eight best eight practice best. actions, but we've had, we've reported more than that because we've in our in digging around and stuff and talking to people, we've come we've come across a lot of projects. So the big one, you know, there've been over 20 actions that we're reporting on. Um, the way the reporting goes is really pretty interesting. You 
um, take these actions, you put them in, and then when they cycle them back, they put together a sustainability plan for the community. So we have that, and that's available on the website. And I could provide that so you can see where we're at, which is um, pretty exciting. As far as the step three, the last thing, the requirement is this B3 benchmarking tool. So Moorhead will be the first community in the metro that does benchmarking. And basically what it does is it captures your energy use at today. And if any, as improvements, as buildings are improved and things like that, it will be a benchmark to measure um, how, how things are improved. And that's a system that the state had put together um, for communities participating in Green Steps. And like I said, thank you for your good work. So. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you. Uh, Haley's last day is in it. Oh. Excuse me. <laughs> Council Member Watson Curry. <laughs> thank you. Hold on, Dan. <laughs> uh, so, Scott and Haley, thanks so much. I This is the second time I've gotten to receive this information, and it's just as exciting. And great job. I mean, I don't like using microphones. You did a great job with the microphone for a long <laughs> time. Um, one thing I wanted to just highlight um, was I, I love the integration of all of the studies that we already have, and they're tied into our strategic planning. So you mentioned the River Corridor <gasps> study um, and some of the um, other things that we're tying in as well. I know you prevented, presented at the Food Commission, so we talked about maybe tying that in as well. So I, I just love that holistically this is sort of rolled into a lot of things. And uh, Scott, I know your position is one year with green, the Green Corps, and Haley, you will, you, your energy will will be missed. So thank you for all you've done. I'll miss you guys. <laughs> Council Member Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, and thanks for all your hard work on the Green Sub Cities. It's, it's really been neat to see how Moorhead compares um, when you start to look at these things. But what I think is really amazing is that Moorhead has been doing a lot of these things for decades. Um, and not just the city, uh, you know, Moorhead Public Service has done an awful lot of stuff when it comes to um, energy efficiencies, energy savings, alternative energy. And the simple fact that we're getting more than half of our energy from renewable resources is pretty amazing um, considering our geographic location where we are um, and uh, the state of, of uh, the energy industry these days. So, um, so thank you very much. I think this program really um, kind of shows where Moorhead should be shining and maybe now it just brings all these little things to the forefront. So thank you. Thank you. And I would agree. Thank you for your work. It gives me one more thing to brag about at the State of the City. <laughs> one more thing to brag about. <laughs> Anytime I can do that, <laughs> excellent. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, and congratulations. I, I, I know Mr. Molly was talking about your last day coming up soon. Yes. Oh. So if you wanted to yeah, finish up with absolutely. that. Yeah, absolutely. It's just been a joy and a pleasure to work with you. You know, your hard work and your work ethic and just you've got a great nature. So thanks for making our office a better place. Mm, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we look forward to great things. Let us know if you need anything okay, down the road. You. I do want to just add one other thing. We may see be seeing more of this. Um, uh, in terms of um, bringing younger people, fresh eyes, into um, city public affairs. And so we're looking at, um, we have a, a fellow Matthew who's going to be uh, supporting economic development initiatives. We're looking at someone for community development. We have a sustainability, Julia Brooklocker will be replacing Haley. We're also looking at some opportunities in GIS and IT, computer mapping, um, and some, some, other, some other options to make uh, the, the city of Moorhead reflective of the young community that it is. So. Those are internship programs that we're formalizing. So, and Dan's leading that effort, and it's a very good job. Dan, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Before we go <clears throat> to approving the minutes, so which is number six, I apologize to everyone. I know Councilmember White was telling me to not to forget to do this, and I keep forgetting every meeting. But this is a reminder that if people want to address the council during the meeting, uh, they should fill out the yellow forms that are found right outside uh, in the entryway uh, in the hallway and bring it to the clerk. And when we, when we get to the citizens addressing the council, we will uh, call you up if one of these forms are filled out. And so just to remember, uh, this item is for only for citizens to address items that, that are not on the agenda. So my apologies for that mentioning that earlier. Uh, moving on to item number six, <coughs> approval of the minutes of the March 11th, 2018 City Council meeting. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Move to approve. Motion made by Council Member Paulson, seconded by Council Member Carlson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. 
Number seven, citizens addressing the council. Are there any citizens present that wish to address the council? Seeing none, we'll move to item number nine, which is a public hearing. The public hearing is in regards to a request, I'm sorry, a public hearing regarding the request of Tony Paul on behalf of 815 Partners LLP for a property tax exemption for a commercial project located at 815 37th Avenue South with a parcel number of 58.031.0027. And can I get a motion to open the public hearing? Second. A motion made by Councilmember Duran, seconded by Councilmember Paulson. All in favor of say motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We are now in public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we're trying something a little bit new tonight on our economic development item. So you'll notice up on the, on the screen here, we'll just have a kind of brief summary of the, the project at hand. So as the mayor mentioned, uh, we do have a commercial industrial property tax exemption on hand tonight. Uh, Tony Paul is the applicant. Tony is present as, as well as uh, Lisa Novotny Leno with, um, with the development team if you have any questions specific to the project. Um, basically, a little bit of detail behind the project. They are looking to construct a 10,000 square foot uh, commercial building. This is uh, just north of the Azul Plaza in South Moorhead, so where the uh, Hornbachers is down there. Uh, one of the tenants will, will be Village Family Health Services. We're very excited that um, they are keeping their operations in Moorhead. Uh, we know they had some opportunities to, to cross, so we're very, very uh, happy, happy that they're staying. There will also be uh, another uh, tenant inside the building. Uh, Village Family Health Services is the majority of the, of the building, uh, but there will be a, another office uh, inside that building, which uh, the tenant will be late, named at a later date. Uh, the project itself is estimated at $1.4 million, so a significant uh, commercial development. As you can recall, we did make some changes to our commercial industrial property tax exemption policy. Uh, we, we simplified our, our table there, so this one uh, being new taxable value at, at um, over our million dollar threshold, uh, they have a job goal which they do meet, uh, and they are eligible for a five year property tax exemption. If approved tonight, uh, construction would begin in May of 2019, so when weather permits, with a completion of October of 2019. Uh, it's a great, great project. We're really uh, thankful again that Village Family Health Services is continuing to keep operations here in Moorhead. Uh, with that, they do meet all the policies and, and, um, and objectives of our, of our goals of the commercial industrial property tax exemption. We would be seeking uh, approval tonight. Again, Tony Paul and Alyssa are here for any questions you may have, and I'd be happy to answer your questions too. Any questions for Mr. Lapointe or, I'm sorry, you say Mr. Paul is here along with? Yep, uh, Alyssa Novotny Leno. Okay. Are there any questions? Comments? Council Member White. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. What you, you said the second half of the building, you don't, it's, is it going to be retail, restaurant? Do you have no um, idea yet? No, it's not half. It's only probably 30% of it, 20% okay. of it. Um, basically, what the, the plan of building the building bigger to begin with was so that they could expand into it. So, in the meantime, for three years or so, we got to go find a tenant that complements, does something with them or whatever that's going to be flexible and we'll move on at some point. Thank you. It, it looks like a great project, so congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Paulson. I, I'd like to agree with my fellow colleagues. I think it looks like a great project, and I thank you for the hard work uh, that you've done in keeping the village here in Moorhead. Um, I think that's a, that's a great thing, just like Derek had mentioned. Um, and also, just thank you very much for your investment in Moorhead. It's these types of projects that the city really wants to help incentivize and, and uh, bring to Moorhead. Uh, so thank you very much for, for your work on this. Yeah, well, thank you. And it's obviously, it's, it's not us that's doing the services in the community. It's the village. I should actually right. have somebody, one of them, one of those people here, but I dropped the ball on that. 
So, but it, but it's that. your building and your yeah. investment, so yeah, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. important for thank for you. that. So, Absolutely, thank you. thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you again. Really appreciate thank you. it. So the public hearing technically is still open. Is there anyone here in, in the audience that would like to speak on this public hearing? I'll ask again, is there any, anyone else here in the audience that would like to speak on this public hearing? Seeing no further comment, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Second. Motion made by Council Member Watson Curry, seconded by Council Member Carlson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Now is there a, res a, sorry, a motion to approve the resolution to approve the property tax? May I make a motion to approve the resolution to uh, approve property tax exemption for 815 partnership LLP for project commercial located at 815 Second. Motion made by Council Member Paulson, seconded by Council Member White. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Congratulations and thank you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. We'll move on to <clears throat> item number 10, which is a public hearing regarding the request of, and I'm going to, and I apologize in advance, the request of Brian Kanowski. Kanowski on behalf of Epic Holdings LLC for property tax exemption for a Renaissance Zone project located at 1 4th Street South. So I'll have to make a request for a motion to open the public he hearing on item number 10. Motion made by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member Paulson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying, I'm sorry, Hendrickson. Thank you. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We are now in public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, again, I'm going to be a little bit more in depth with this one just because this is our first uh, Renaissance Zone project application. So we're, we're very excited about that. Uh, before I get started, too, I want to make note that uh, Brian Kanowski is in attendance as well as uh, Brian Berg and Brian Pattengale. So we got three Brian's here uh, <laughs> representing the project. So we're happy to have their expertise. Um, again, a little bit of, of just brief history about the Renaissance Zone. So we, ha we do have a new council here. Uh, we uh, did revise our Urban Progress Zone uh, in September of 2018. There was a newly created Renaissance Zone. This was really to um, really kind of look at our policies related to Fargo's Renaissance Zone, North Dakota's Renaissance Zone. We created our own goals and objectives specific to downtown Moorhead uh, and really kind of tailored our incentives that made sense to developers that if they are doing projects on the other side of the river, they can, they can come in, uh, grab a policy that's not foreign uh, in a lot of ways, and we're able to kind of speed that, that process up. So we think we have a really competitive uh, process with our Renaissance Zone, uh, and I think it's showing with this uh, first project that's already coming to, uh, to light for us here just a few short months after approved. History of the, the project itself. So I wanna again go through a little bit of history of where, where we've uh, came from, uh, how we're, we're getting to this point here. So in um, end of November, we had a city council executive session and this was really looking at, we had some development interests on the site uh, and there was a question of how we should sell the land. You know, what are our options to sell the land? There's a full RFP process. There's the ability for the city not to sell the land. There's also uh, the notice requirement that's required throughout the, the process that has to happen. Uh, so there's all these different kind of process. At that point in time, the, the council uh, gave direction to notice the property, but have a little bit more in-depth notice where we are looking for a mixed use project uh, on this site specifically um, that meets the goals and objectives of our Renaissance Zone policy. So that was the, the, the notice that went out in mid-December. Uh, I did contact developers and, and kind of sent out that notice to some different ones. That notice closed in the middle of January where we had one proposal, which was the EPIC group. Uh, at that point in time, we came back to a city council executive session at the end of January where we were looking at direction of how we should proceed with this proposal. At that time, uh, there was uh, some consensus with the council and we decided to move forward uh, with, the, with the project at hand. 
Uh, now looking specific at the project that we did receive, uh, again, this is a, uh, an application on behalf of Epic Holdings LLC to construct a new uh, building, which is a mixed-use building that has underground parking. The name is called Bolig, which is Norwegian for resident or housing. Uh, we'll, we'll have commercial on the, the main level with uh, residential on the top floors, but there is potential option for commercial on the top level, so that we're not ruling anything out, but it just depends on, on tenant situations as we get closer. Um, the tenants will be named at a later date. Obviously, we're, we're kind of going through some logistics of it. Um, Epic really feels uh, strongly that this is a building that will become an I iconic building for our downtown that pays respect to our Scandinavian heritage that overlooks the Red River with views of Moorhead for miles. Um, you know, I, I should even, before we even get into this too, there's, there's a lot of history on this site, which I know the council knows, but maybe the public doesn't. Uh, at this point in time, it's actually still owned by the railroad. Uh, BNSF. So I know City Manager Chris Volkers has been doing a fantastic job with the railroad to, to kind of spur that conversation along. Um, hopefully we're, we're days away of getting that title transferred. At that point in time, um, we would be looking to transfer that title then to, to this company to build the project. Um, so we're working on that, but it's, it's getting close. Um, a couple other things to note on the project itself. So tonight we are looking at the incentives itself. Uh, we're also looking at the, the developer's agreement uh, and a purchase agreement as well. There is another step, and I know there may be some questions about this, but there is um, a, a requirement that this building uh, has to get a conditional use permit through the Planning Commission, which will ultimately come to uh, the City Council. Uh, one CUP is to build in the floodplains. We have obviously a floodplain throughout our city. Um, when, you're, when you're building in there, there are flood requirements that the, the developer does have to uh, meet. There's also another CUP for disruption of soil in the flood way, which is again the, the, the line that basically um, is an area where there's really not much disturbance. So there's some, they're, they're not planning on building any building here, but if they disturb any soils, there's some permit requirements that have to go. Um, that right now is planning on going to the April 3rd Planning Commission, which would come back to you on April 8th for City Council uh, approval. We, uh, we received this application, we received the Renaissance Zone application, and we do feel that, uh, that this uh, application does meet our goals and objectives. Again, remember when we're looking at um, the Renaissance Zone, we're looking at the intent of the project. Maybe, uh, you know, not getting into the specifics, but it's the intent. We're going from, you know, a surface parking lot that the city or BNSF has, has owned for a number of years, collecting uh, zero property tax on it. Um, very underutilized uh, in a lot of regards. Uh, so some of the goals that we're looking at from this policy is we're adding more housing, which is, is towards our 505 housing goal. We're creating a downtown entryway where, again, we're going from a surface parking lot to a, a, a significant investment uh, along our riverfront. We're promoting infill. Um, we're creating active spaces with our, our ground floor commercial retail. Uh, and adding, uh, again, a more active, vibrant use with more people and, and, uh, and, and active uses on our, down, uh, in our, on our ground level as, as well as maybe above uh, for our downtown. The investment, uh, so again, re as I remember, uh, as a, as a, um, basically from memory with our, our Renaissance Zone policy, there's three different levels of term. There's a, a 5, 10, and 15-year level of, in of incentive term. Each of them have an a investment threshold, which is $75 a square foot to meet a five-year exemption term, $125 a square <clears> foot to meet a 10-year term, and then $175 a square feet to make a 15-year term. Uh, again, as, a, as just a refresher, the first five years are 100% exempt. That's, that's new taxable value, so the land still is taxable. If it's a 10-year exemption, years one through five are 100%, years six through 10 are 75%. And then if it's a 15-year deal, one through five, 100%, six through 10, 75, years 11 through 15 are 50%. So we're looking at a gradual scale of kind of cutting back those incentives. We're all about trying to stabilize these, these projects, uh, get them on their feet, make them successful, and then we can start kind of coming back in and, and recouping some of that taxable uh, value. In this particular project, uh, we have about an eight, a little over $8 million investment. 
there's about 45,000 square feet, which equates to approximately $180 a square foot. So in this particular project, they will be eligible for a 15-year property tax exemption with that gradual scale. Uh, if approved today, uh, obviously with the title of the transfer, they would, uh, would hope to start construction this spring uh, with uh, the hope of a completion of December of 2020. Uh, obviously, there's a, 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 a lot of things going on in this project. The, as a part of the purchase, so the sale of the project, of the property, uh, Epic's company has offered $200,000 to the city for the land itself, the buildable land of, of the project. Um, and um, you know, City Manager Chris Volkers can talk about how kind of some of those proceeds kind of go back into a, an account for downtown and some improvements of downtown. Uh, one thing to note, since we do not have the, the title transferred yet, uh, we are looking for approval of a conditional approval based on when that title is transferred, we would move forward with uh, the sale. Um, and uh, we would be authorizing the city manager and the city attorney to finalize those details of the developer's agreement. We've come a long ways uh, in those conversations. We feel like we're very close, but um, uh, for the purpose of just fine-tuning those, those details of the agreement, we'd be asking for uh, approval of that for, the, the, again, the city manager and the city attorney to finalize that, that agreement. With that, the developer is here to uh, answer any questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions, and again, excited uh, to, to, to see this project come together. Councilmember Carlson. First of all, Derek and uh, the three Bryans, <laughs> thank you very much for your patience with um, this title issue. I know that that is probably frustrating, um, but we, we certainly appreciate your patience because um, we really appreciate also the name that you came up with. I think it will be um, very interesting for people coming to Moorhead and they, they're going to learn how to speak a different language when they come here with being in close proximity to the Yumcom Center also. Um, can you uh, remind us again how many apartments are going to be in there and how many are one bedroom, how many are two bedroom? Yeah, you, uh, you read my mind on that one. Um, for the unit breakdown, I'll, I'll let um, the developer maybe touch on that, but right now they're proposed to have 40 uh, residential units, apartment units. Uh, there'd be two commercial units on the lower level, but I'll let um, Brian Berg, the architect, touch on the number break. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having us here today. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on the actual unit mix. We're, we're talking about uh, a lot of different options for how those units can be configured. Because of the views that are pre you know, predominantly to the west but also to the east, uh, there's some opportunities to, to do some really interesting things with two-story units possibly there. And so we're looking at how, how that would work. In general, we're talking about 40 units, like, like Derek said. Uh, but uh, the exact mix of one bedrooms to two bedrooms or loft style large volume to more of a traditional layout is still a little bit up in the air. We're working through that right now. And, and as Derek said, we've got right now, we're, we're proposing two separate tenant spaces on the main floor, one of which would probably be some sort of a, of a, uh, a destination restaurant that would have a, a balcony overlooking so but those are all still details to be worked out and and uh, important to have the land before we get too far down that road so um, and I think Derek you had mentioned um, that there is a possibility of maybe some commercial space on the top level also is what what would be the We've talked about, about uh, we've that. talked about options for um, it's such it's going to be such a visible space up there, and so uh, maybe something that's somewhat connected to one of the entities on the main floor that would allow you not to necessarily be preparing food up there, but to have an event space up there that would be it would be one of the greatest event spaces in the area here, um, and you know, we've talked mm -hmm. about different options for that. So I think that we're still exploring that uh, to a certain extent too. If we did that, obviously that would bring the unit count in terms of the number of apartments down just a little bit, and so we want to make sure that we're finding a good balance between commercial and, and uh, residential space in the building and and uh, you know the parking on that site uh, with the underground parking and, and some of the things we've been talking about with with city engineering about the possibility of, of the reconfiguration of what's happening along with Center Avenue and and possibly the re reconfiguration of that intersection and maybe adding a little bit of street parking along there's some some things that are ongoing discussions there that will help with that as well so Thank you. mayor I just want to 
add a couple things I, I forgot to note too. I think there were some questions about the bike path that was on the rendering as well. Um, you'll, you will notice up on the screen there's kind of a gray uh, sloping down the, the, the kind of flood, uh, on the flood way side. Um, this was proposed, um, obviously there's some certain flood requirements, uh, some steepness on that sloping there. Uh, what we've advised through city staff and myself is to show that through our CUP process that goes through uh, kind of DNR and some of the, the requirements to that conditional use permit. Um, I, I think there's some logistics things that still need to get worked out. Uh, it probably, well I can say it probably won't get built obviously with the, the start of the project, but we're not wanting to rule anything out. We want a connection obviously from the project, the residents to uh, the riverfront. So trying to figure out how that fits. Obviously we got the railroad tracks. There's not a very good connection down there existing. So we're, we've, we've suggested to, to leave it, make it a part of the, the application request. Um, and we'll work through those details as it gets closer and as it becomes more feasible. Council Member Paulson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple things and I do have one question. Um, this project to me is, is, uh, is, is an example of successful private-public partnership in bringing something like this into downtown Moorhead. Um, I remember talking with Derek about a year ago and he showed me this layout of where all these buildings could go and all these empty parking lots we have downtown. And it, it just kind of opened up my eyes to say, hey, we, we have so much space and, we ha and what can we do with all these things? And, and so Derek, you know, I really hand it to you to bringing, you know, bringing this whole discussion forward and really driving that home. Um, and we're seeing multiple different projects downtown that, that are successful. Um, as far as the, 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 the private uh, side of things with Epic Holdings, this, this project is a pretty amazing project. And um, to be able to bring this many units downtown and then still have that Scandinavian uh, influence to the, uh, to the architecture um, is pretty neat and, and exactly what this space needs. Um, and my question is, you know, we have five, five floors here. Why can't you go higher and have more floors? We, uh, it, it, it's an enticing question, but we're right now we are at the absolute limits of what the soil will bear there without doing deep foundations. And we think that deep foundations would probably make the project uh, not financially feasible at this point because it's mostly because of the site. It's a challenging site. There's no question about mm -hmm. that. It has a significant slope built into that site. Um, as, as Derek mentioned, we're right on the edge of the floodway. Uh, we are in the floodplain, so we have some challenges that are related to that. We'll have to, the, the lower level, the parking garage, will have to be floodproof construction, meeting the FEMA requirements for floodproof uh, construction. And those are challenging things to do. And because there are very specific um, elevations that were required to build to uh, related to the the flood protected elevation and the lowest level below the flood protected elevation in order to qualify for that flood protected basement we can't go any deeper and there's a the, the so it's basically the weight of the soil that's there is if this if that wasn't an issue on this site if we didn't have to deal with the flood protected elevation we would probably go deeper with our basement we'd remove a lot of that soil which is a weight burden that's on that site and we wouldn't have any problems with with going a little bit higher but because we can only go five feet below that that protected flood elevation we can't get that soil weight off of there so we that means we have to put all of our foundations down deep which mm. would mean doing caissons or pilings or something like that to do it and it just gets to be really cost prohibitive for a, for a footprint of this size it's a relatively mm -hmm. small footprint that we're mm -hmm. talking about here there's not a it's not a huge building in terms of, of surface area so yeah to be honest when when we first were looking at this parking lot I thought there would it'd be impossible to build anything up there <laughs> so um, I really have to hand it to all you folks uh, to be able to to build such a beautiful building on such a small area and make it all work with all the different constraints that that were presented um, is pretty amazing so thank you you bet and I just want to follow up if I may <clears throat> I I think the project is awesome I mean I you know I will tell you agreed with Councilmember Paulson when we were looking at this we're like really but this is is projects like yours and Brian's that I spoke about at the state of the uh, cities where 
we want people who are going to be creative coming to the city and take what we think this little piece of property might you know, not look like much, but your vision and your creativity, and that's going to be a very majestic look coming into downtown. It's definitely going to be a signature building that's that's going to be a landmark. You know, people will people will be able to see it from a long ways, coming from the from the Fargo side of the river, when you're coming over that bridge and you see the big Bolick sign on the side of the building. There, I think it'll be definitely be a landmark. It makes a statement, and I think that you know I can probably speak for the council that it's a statement that we want to you know have. I mean, and so thank you we appreciate for your creativity, uh, for putting that project together, and thank you, Derek, for facilitating it. Uh, you know, I think it's going to be a pretty nice addition to our downtown. If you find any other properties that you feel like you wish to. <laughs> We're always looking. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, if there are no more council statements or questions, I'll uh, ask, and I do this, everyone, because it's required. Uh, but I'll ask, uh, is there anyone else in the audience that wish to speak on this public hearing? Is there anyone else here in the audience that would like to speak on this public hearing? Seeing none, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Second. Motion made by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member Paulson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Then we'll move to the resolution portion. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? Second. Do we need to state the resolution? We're good? Okay. Motion made by Council Member Hendrickson, seconded by Council Member Paulson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you again. Appreciate it. So we're moving on to, uh, just for everyone to know, we have <clears throat> a number of public hearings uh, coming up. Uh, this will be number 11 on the agenda item. This is a public hearing for Center Avenue Street Improvements. I believe that's engineering number 19-A2-02. And with that, is there a motion to open the public hearing for this matter? So move. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Take your pick. All right, we'll give it to Councilmember White, to who have made the motion, seconded by Councilmember <laughs> Hendrickson. All in favor, say motion. Please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. We are now in public hearing regarding matter or agenda item 11. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and members of Council. So the first project is the Center Avenue Street Improvements. This is one of our uh, annual CIP projects. It's been uh, programmed for a while. We're partnering with Moorhead Public Service. Uh, they're replacing water mains, and then we're following up with a mill and overlay. Uh, being that this is in the downtown area, uh, very high profile, so we, we took a pretty long, involved public improvement process to make sure we had a lot of input on this. And just as a background, this one has the PCI range. Um, PCI stands for Pavement Condition Index, ranges from 23 to 77. Mostly it was 50 to 70 is, is mostly what it was. And that was indicating it was a good candidate for a mill and overlay. And the, the last major work we did on it was back in 1989, so the timing is appropriate for it. Um, since it's high profile downtown, we took a lot of uh, look at the traffic issues and because it, it's busier, it, it has a, a lot of uh, driveway accesses, the intersections are spaced close together for this type of a arterial roadway. Uh, it has relatively higher crash rates, but it, you know nothing that was really serious, but there were some issues to look at. Uh, one of the main issues was limited left turn lanes. A good stretch of this roadway is a four-lane roadway. And what's very commonly done now, if you have a four-lane roadway, 
they actually carry traffic better if you make it be a three-lane roadway, and that's because you give left-turning vehicles a place to be. They're the ones that tend to stop traffic, and if people aren't paying attention, stop traffic leads to accidents. And so by converting it to a three-lane section, it'll be safer and it'll still carry traffic efficiently. And that also, since we weren't planning a full reconstruction, that meant we had some extra space in the pavement to use. And so the question really was, do we want to address parking needs or bike needs or both? And that was a major focus of the public input process that uh, brings us to where we are now. Sidewalks generally were pretty good out there, although there were a few ADA issues for us to address. And utility-wise, it's an old part of town. The utilities are old. Sanitary sewer, that's not as much of a concern. We can line that with trenchless technology. So the sewers weren't a concern for us. But the water main, there have been numerous breaks over the years. This is a cast iron water main. With our clay soils, those cast iron water mains get eaten away over time, and it needs to be replaced. And so Moorhead Public Service is proceeding with a water main replacement project. As I mentioned, we had quite a bit of public input on this. Going back to April of 2017, we had focus groups that involved uh, members of the downtown plus uh, city staff. And we had an open house meeting on March 21st, just last week. And uh, the report had been presented to the council actually back in June of 2018, and that's where we got the marching orders to finish the plans and design it the way it is. Basically, back in June of 2018, you know, we, the mill and overlay, that was a given. We needed to do that. And then the proposal was to convert to a three-lane roadway section, and that was also supported. There are some negatives uh, in that we were... Uh, we, we were taking out a few trees out there, but we're also replacing trees. We're doing some additional landscaping afterwards. Uh, we are adding dedicated bike lanes on the bridge. And then from 4th to 7th Street, we're calling it a wide outside lane because there was a desire to add parking to uh, foster some of this development. Interestingly enough, this project was going and the decision was made to add some parking on Center Avenue prior to the project you were just hearing about on 4th and Center. And you know, the hope is that we'll have more of that infill development and they really will want that on-street parking. And the lanes adjacent, so the through lanes are wider than normal. The minimum would allow us to have 11-foot lanes. We're actually having 14 to 18 or 19-foot lanes. It's kind of variable. There's a few areas in where the curb width uh, varies a bit, and so that's why there's some variability to that. But that's enough room for the more accomplished bicyclists to feel a little more comfortable. Uh, ones that aren't as comfortable will probably take uh, 4th Street down to the river and get on the city trail system that's separated. Okay. Uh, we're also proposing to remove the traffic signal at 7th Street. Uh, we did review it. It does not meet warrants. It's been, ever since we did the uh, quiet zone, uh, it's been harder to time it with the other signals because this one is not preempted by railroad tracks, whereas 8th and 4th and 5th and the one at 7th and 1st Avenue North, those are all affected by every time a train comes through. And so we really, this one is always out of sync. Mm -hmm. Okay. And since it has a relatively low volume using it, there will be adequate gaps just because of the signals already along there that it, it'll function better without the signal. And then uh, there's some pedestrian improvements that we're going to do. And then we're moving or removing a couple of access points. And one of them is the, to the city parking lot next to the Thai Orchid. If you've ever tried turning out of there, it's very difficult to make a left turn there. And the, the United Sugars access, which lines up at 6th Street, uh, but that, that's another one. It's very little used, and it'll be better for us to just close it off for now mm -hmm. and, and use that space more for parking. And then we're, the proposal is to add on-street parking primarily on the north side of the road there. And I'll, I'll back up. As far as the ADA, the, the biggest improvement we'll make ADA-wise is 
The sidewalk between 7th and 8th Street by the bank on the north side of the road, that's not an ADA compatible because of the way the trees are in there and with the other utilities out there, you're constantly zigzagging and it, it, the only way for us to uh, fit a sidewalk in there was to actually we're getting a landscape easement and we're going to put some landscaping in the parking area adjacent and we're going to get the trees out of there so we can have a sidewalk go straight through there. So this exhibit gives an idea, it's, it's kind of a far away view, but it, it shows what the, highlights what the primary proposal is for the project. And this is from that June uh, 11th action that the council did uh, back in 2018 is where this exhibit comes from. So there's some landscaping improvements, sidewalk improvements, a three lane section, more at public service under a separate contract, we'll do the water main and our contractor will coordinate with them and follow up as soon after them as possible. For the most part, this project, the road work, will be happening July and August and September. Uh, to the extent that we can get in and do some things prior to that, we will, but that will be difficult because more at public services water main work will be going from April uh, into July. So this is, uh, it falls under our rehabilitation type work. So it's a mill and overlay. It gets assessed at the $30 per adjusted front foot. It's also a collector arterial roadway. So it has an area wide assessment. Per our policy, that's halfway to the next arterial collectors. In this case, the next arterials are First Avenue North and Main Avenue. So it doesn't have a very large uh, area wide assessment. And so this map shows the area that's highlighted. Because of the way the railroad tracks are on the north side, or on the south side of First Avenue, we extended the assessment area effectively to First Avenue in that area. Um, but to the south, it only goes to the BN tracks. So most of the project financing comes from municipal state aid funds. And that's the gas tax money that the city receives from the state of Minnesota that can be spent on roads that we have on our municipal state aid street system and Center Avenue is one of those. We will generate about $126,000 in special assessments per state law with the bonding. If we're doing a general obligation bond, 20% of what we bond for has to be assessed. So the maximum amount we can bond for on this project is that uh, $504,000 or that, that's the city share of it. But basically, we cannot bond any more than what we're showing. So anything that doesn't get covered by assessments or the general obligation bond is going to have to come out of municipal state aid dollars. So this just uh, this slide here summarizes the special assessments. It gives you an idea of what the range of the assessments are. The largest assessments are in the city parking lots. Now, that doesn't mean the city's paying all of that cost through the agreement with the mall. It's somewhere around 80% of the cost gets passed on back down to the mall through the, the agreement that we have with them for maintenance of the parking. But the city does have some cost share to this. And so again, it's area wide and direct abutting front footage that gets assessed. And so there's 72 parcels that were impacted. And then this is another slide that just summarizes the total project cost. And I would highlight on this, because of the city share to this of the $504,800, that has a $32,800 impact to the debt levy. And that would be equivalent to about a $1.64 tax increase per year on the current median value home. So for tonight, the hearing tonight is receive any additional public comment and then to consider a resolution to order the improvements. We have advertised this project for bids and we expect to receive bids on April 17th. So we would have a, a hopefully a contract to award on April 22nd. We did hold one informational meeting to talk about special assessments and the projects generally last Thursday. And there was one person that came to that meeting that had a question on Center Avenue. It was just asking on how the special assessments were calculated. Uh, 
other than that, the, the project input we had was all during the project development process back in 2017 and 2018. And as you can imagine, there's, you never get everybody to agree on everything. We had consensus on some things and other things were kind of mixed. All of that information was presented to the council and the direction from the council was to build the project that we're doing now with the parking on the north side, uh, improving bike lanes as well uh, to the best that we can. So thank you. If you have any questions. Does council have any questions or comments for Mr. Trowbridge? Uh, Councilmember Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Tom, for the information. Um, you mentioned one location about um, ADA compliance and fourth and center um, is a bit complicated to navigate to with the different islands. I just wanted to make sure that that is another place that's addressed. Yeah. And I know we're still in flux with maybe some new things developing in our downtown and tying in um, the bike infrastructure as well so we can accommodate all the ways we move. Yes. And so we do have. Uh, at the intersections, we're, I, I didn't highlight that we're replacing the traffic signals at 4th Street and 5th Street as well. And in doing that, they'll be, the signals will be brought up to ADA standards. Uh, and we, we have crosswalks at the locations. We'll, we'll modify 4th Street was complicated because of the bridge as well. Uh, we're, it, it's actually partially straddling the bridge abutment, which makes it complicated. but. Uh, we will have uh, good pedestrian crossings there, and we've also been working with the development of the Bolig Epic site to make sure that uh, pedestrian access works well for them as well. Any other questions or comments from Mr. Trowbridge? <coughs> yes, sir. Okay. Seeing none. <clears throat> Is there anyone here in the audience that would like to speak on this public hearing? Good evening. My name is Patrick Vesey. I'm here on behalf of the Moorhead Center Mall. And uh, some of this stuff was just brought to my attention a couple of weeks ago regarding Center Avenue. And we're obviously a proponent of uh, the changes that are going. But one of the... Uh, um, I also want to back up a little bit. We're a huge proponent for the Bow Lake, too. Uh, we think that's going to be fantastic for the downtown community. But I wanted to visit about, uh, Mr. Trowbridge just brought up, he was saying that it was uh, option D. Is that right? D. Uh, I believe it was D. And, and what was approved in the June meeting minutes was option B as in boy. So I wanted to discuss with the, the commissioners um, something that's of concern to us is that access that's by Ty Orchid. That is, uh, as Mr. Trowbridge said, it's, it's, they're taking it away to add more parking for that property, which we're in, we're in favor of. But what that does by removing that approach is critical to some of our tenants. Well, there's a dock door for, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there's a dock door for furniture for less, which is instrumental for them to get their trucks in and to back up and to get furniture. That's why we put that dock door there because of the traffic flow. And I just want everybody to understand how important that is to us. And, and I had called uh, Commissioner Gertz to get some, and we didn't get uh, a chance to discuss this. But it is of a large concern of what we do with the Moorhead Center Mall as we move forward, because obviously we're a huge proponent for improving the downtown community. And we've got a lot of things that we want to do with this, and we're long-term uh, investors. So I don't want to uh, have you all make a decision based on removing some critical components of access for the tenants that that is ex it's going to be detrimental um to them i wish i could have had a representative from furniture for less but that's why i came tonight just to verify that this was the case and it shows this option d but it's actually option b that you're talking about the only difference between the two is removing that access point uh, from the south parking lot and we were told by uh, mr zimmerman that the city had actually uh, uh, wanted to go with, or the engineering department suggested option D, and that's probably why it reads that way, going into that meeting in June. I wasn't at the meeting in June, and I did, I did review it on the um, TV. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention. It is of huge concern to the Moorhead Center Mall for that purpose. The assessments don't change, but it's uh, absolute, absolutely instrumental to our access points for, 
furniture for less than other tenants there. You can mm. see that. Maybe you can yeah, reference I, I that. Can, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to share. That That's yeah. very, very crucial to us. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, the alt, yeah, alternate D came, I think that came from the slide back in June. Now, the difference between alternate B and D actually had to do with using, so, so alternate D was we weren't, we were just not making a decision on parking or bike lanes at that time. That had to do with the road striping. And it, the closure of the access by the Thai Orchid was in either of the options. So that part of it didn't change from it. But you know, this, it, as far as the loading dock, that's the first time that I can recall that being raised specifically. We can certainly evaluate that further if you'd like us to. So. But uh, the proposal for uh, removing it, removing that access had a lot to do with the visibility, the sight lines. We had some concerns with how that functioned and we believe that it'll be a safer corridor without that driveway access there. But uh, we'll, we can certainly get some more information from the Furniture for Less on how their delivery works. So. Madam City Manager Volkers. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Tom. I think I'm confused. In June, what was approved? June, what? so it was, it was alternate B was approved. Okay, so now yeah, we're... We, we had recommended alternate D, uh, which, and, and, and the difference really is alternate D, we would have striped it like it had bike lanes, but not signed it as bike lanes. I mean, we would right. have had, and, and so really we weren't calling them bike lanes and we weren't calling anything parking. And the direction from the council after the public input they received on that day was the preference was to go with alternate B, which had the wide outside lanes and on-street parking on the north side of the road. So what I've got wrong in this slide is the, the alternate, that title. You know, actually this was, it didn't even need the alternate D because this was, this was addressing the issues generally. Okay, so, so you're yeah. the the <laughs> okay. I think yeah. the request for approval tonight is for B. Yeah, the 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 plans. Yes, yes. So we're not changing anything since June, other Correct. than that access point that Patrick's well, well, talking about. So I mean, I can get more information on Sorry. that yeah. and and bring that to the council if and and at that point with further discussion, if the council would like us to do a change order, we can always do a change order. There you go. So what I would say is let's proceed to bids as we are. We'll get more information. And that we're, regardless of what we do, we're doing some curb and gutter removal in that location. So I don't think that that is a significant alteration to the plans. Basically, it's a relatively minor change order if we're to proceed. That's a great that. idea. And then we can proceed with the project. The timing is yeah. critical. But if the council wants, you can come back with some more information. Okay. Council Member Durand. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, I would support doing some further research to make sure that that business does not get, um, suffer any ill consequences because of the removal of that, that entrance. Um, so I, I, I look forward to seeing what you uh, can bring forward. I'm, I'm pretty confident in, in, uh, in your abilities to figure out a solution and to, to find a different, you know, alternate route into that destination for their for their deliveries but I think it's very important that we do so and we do right by them council member Hendrickson uh, thank you mr. mayor if, if we did get um, information from furniture for less would we look at deliveries or what kind of information are we going to look at yeah strictly for their deliveries which is a I mean it's a very busy dock for them there with the amount of <laughs> furniture that they're selling that I mean that's the main concern from from an access perspective that's their business but they've we've got a long-term lease with them they have 30,000 square feet in this mall without them uh, you know we're just trying to make improvements to this place to make it something that we envision and obviously we had a large hiccup with uh, with Herbergers going away uh, we don't need any more challenges if we can avoid that and 
And just to back up with um, Mr. Trowbridge, I did have this conversation with Bob Zimmerman going back, and that's why he had talked about option D, is that there were not any obstacles as far as going in and out, as far as it being a, a, a issue, traffic pulling on and off Center Avenue. Bob specifically told that to me and, and said that they were proposing option D for that reason. This changed at the city commission meeting in June that I wasn't aware of, so that's why I need to make this very clear. If we're talking about parking spots, we've got 1,200 and some parking spots around this facility in this mall to, to, to give a better uh, um, parking ratio for even the new development that's happening. But if we're looking at, at trying to make this a walkable community and walkable and bike paths, the things that we're discussing, we're all for the betterment of downtown. We want this to thrive. Obviously, we've got an investment here. But um, if, if we're going to take away one access point, why wouldn't we treat every business along Center Avenue the same and make it all parking? If that was the case, I just don't understand why we're looking at just one, because it's really going to be, if you take this access point out, it's going to give you maybe one or two additional parking spots when we have a whole parking lot full. So I just want it, to, it's very instrumental to one of our largest tenants, so that's, that's a concern. Madam City Manager. Um, Mr. Mayor. Um, Patrick, I think, I think um, Councilmember Duran is right. We'll look at it. But we do have emails that we have sent through this whole process to you and Kelly and asking for feedback and input, and we haven't received any responses. So I, was I, I hate meeting. the 11th hour thing here. So. No, no. I was, this was brought to my attention here a couple weeks ago, what was approved, because Bob had told me option D is what we're going with, and that's where the city and okay, why that we'll changed. That I don't up. know. So okay. that, and I was at every... Every meeting. So I, I was, that. That I was, I I was away June, from yep. every meeting. So, yep. um, but that well, was the only one. Well, thank you, sir, for bringing yep. that. Uh, and I know that will spur some conversations. So it's really important to bring that up. So thank yes, you for thank doing you. that. Councilmember Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I agree with uh, Councilmember Duran that, you know, we should gather information. If it, it is, they've got a lot of square footage in the, in the mall, and I think it's just equitable that we that we do get their uh, input, but I'd, I'd like to make a motion. That's okay. Absolutely. We'll have to close. 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 So okay. your motion is, is close. Close the public hearing. Okay. Yeah. So motion made by Councilmember Hendrickson. Is there a second? Second by Council, Councilmember Watson Curry. All in favor of the said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, then 11A would be the resolution. So before we proceed, Madam City Manager, Mr. City Attorney Shockley, with what has been discussed, can we just pass the resolution as stated and then work out the other details? Is that appropriate? That's what I would suggest. Well, if we'll look into it, we'll do the research, we'll come back with some information and possible change order for your decision. Okay. And everyone on council okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a motion to uh, approve the resolution? Second. Uh, motion made by Councilmember Watson Curry, seconded by Councilmember Hendrickson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 12 <clears throat> is a public hearing. Uh, for 8th Street and 13th Avenue North Street Improvements, engineering number 19-A2-06. Is there a motion to open this public hearing? Second. Motion made by Councilmember Duran, seconded by Councilmember Paulson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. We are now in public hearing regarding agenda item 12. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of Council. So this is the 13th Avenue and 8th Street North project, engineering number 19A206. Uh, in this case, what we're proposing is a, a mix of mill and overlay and street rehabilitation and potentially street reconstruction. Uh, 8th Street is where Moorhead Public Service has a cast iron water main that they still need to replace. They have, in previous years, they've replaced, replaced the water main on 13th Avenue North. Okay, and these streets were all initially constructed 1956 to 1970. Uh, by our records, since then, it's mostly just been seal coating since then. 
Um, and this is an area that sidewalks are very inconsistent. Sometimes they're on one side. Uh, there's no places where they're continuous. And some of the ramps are up to date and most of them are not. So what's being proposed is a mill and overlay from approximately 7th to 10th of 13th Avenue and to reconstruct it by the ballpark. One of the reasons we'd want to reconstruct it there is the road is very wide. Um, and then 8th Street, and so we can narrow it because it doesn't need to be that wide. And then 8th Street uh, would be a rehabilitation, so the curb and gutter is in pretty good condition. But since Morehead Public Service is going to be replacing the water main, about half the pavement is gone anyway. At that point, it just is more cost effective to replace the entire pavement section. And then we are proposing to make the sidewalks be continuous on both sides of the roads. And so, so this project and the next project we'll talk about, I put this slide in just for this hearing today. Uh, but I just wanted to refresh everybody on the sidewalk infill policy that the city has. This was something after, after a couple of projects where we had difficulty getting to a consensus. We had the council consider and approve a revision to the policy that clarifies when we'll do sidewalks and what it takes for us to uh, put them in or decide not to put them in. So basically, if there's a continuous walk on one side of the street, we feel that's good enough. We don't have to put in a sidewalk on the other. But if there's not a sidewalk at all, or if the sidewalks are not continuous from one block to the next, then we will put in sidewalks on both sides of the road. We do have some exceptions to that. We can omit if we figure there is significant obstructions to doing that, if the utility conflicts are too great, uh, if there's other encroachments, or for example up in Oakport where there's a rural drainage system and we would need to acquire right away to put it outside of the existing right away. Things like that were an exception where we could just decide at a staff level not to do it. And then the other policy, the other provision there is that if at least 75% of the property owners that are abutting this improvement say that they do not want the sidewalk, and there may be various reasons for it. A lot of times it has to do with not wanting to shovel, but there's also things like a lot of lots are corner lots and maybe their driveway is on the long. So there's the long side where the setback is less, so a lot of times the garages are so close to the street that if you put in a sidewalk, they don't have room to park in their driveway anymore. So a lot of times that's a concern that gets brought up in one of these. And the picture up here actually is, shows how we accommodated that a few years ago. 11th Avenue, just a couple of blocks south, we put in some sidewalks there. And you can see usually our sidewalk is next to the right of way, but in here, in this area, we actually moved it closer to the curb because we were trying to still leave room for people to park where they could. And, and you can just see there in, in the picture there, there is a car parked and they're able to fit between the sidewalk and the, and the garage there. But that's an example of how the policy works. And so this slide here shows the feedback that we received. And so we, we mailed out a letter to the property owners. We were very clear that if they did not respond, it would be counted as a yes vote. So if people did not want it, they had to tell us specifically that they did not want it. We received five no responses, five yes responses, and 22 no responses, or you know, not a response at all. So basically, only 16% said no. So in this case, the sidewalks stay in the project. So the input process for this project, we had an informational design meeting back in January, and that was just to try to make sure people knew we had a project coming, and it was a chance for them to tell us if they had some concerns. At that particular meeting, their main questions were, gosh, how do I get to my driveway if you're redoing the road? Uh, I know one person had a daycare and they were just, you know, can people still drop it off? And the sidewalks, they were in a spot where they did have a sidewalk, so that would be open and we'll work with them during construction as best we can. But that was basically what we had from this neighborhood at that meeting. 
Uh, and then, as you can see, we did mail the letter out on the sidewalk policy and got some feedback on that. And then we did the public hearing notice. And since that got mailed out, we haven't received any written comment uh, at the public informational meeting. Uh, the only question really that came up on this project was just to clarify and make sure that this was still the same project that had been talked about earlier and not another street project. <laughs> and so we clarified that. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, that's, that summarizes the input we've had on that. And so this one is, it's a pavement management. This one, as I said, is mill and overlay, rehab, and reconstruction. The only person getting the high reconstruct assessment happened to be the city. That's for the park, the ballpark. And I'll get to that. I, we're, we're not going to recommend proceeding with that at the present time, but the rest of the project mm. we'd like to, but we have some thinking to do. Funding-wise, we, we have some issues with, with financing the project. So, But uh, the mill and overlay assessment is $30 a foot, and the rehab is $61 a foot. So now the total project base plus alternate could be as much as you know a million two hundred and twenty six thousand uh, dollars the base part was five hundred and eighty two thousand the difference the alternate was doing the reconstruct from 10th to 11th street of 13th avenue north and the reason we made that an alternate was as we were going out for bids we realized that the assessments weren't generating enough for us to bond for the total project cost. So this is a case where we weren't hitting that 20% assessment threshold. And so we've actually received the bids, so those are actual uh, construction, uh, th those are the actual costs that would happen if we were to try to do the entire project. And what we'll pay closer attention to on our projects in the future, this one had a lot of side lot footage and by our policy we don't assess the first 150 feet of side lot so everybody on 13th Avenue North we really weren't assessing them for the project and as a result we got an unbalanced project and that, that happened because kind of late in the process we decided not to do a couple of the other intersecting streets we didn't have time to design them and so we cut those out in retrospect we should have kept at least one more of the side streets in but we can come back and get this in another year when we do those other streets. The plans are still good for that. So, so basically, what we would be proposing to do, and th this is what the assessment summary would have been. And again, the, the reconstruct is the reason the city had that $52,000 assessment was the reconstruct. All the other assessments you see up there are the mill and overlay and the rehab ones. And so you can see what the ranges are. And so now this slide, since we're really only talking about the base bid, I figured I'd put only that information into this slide. And even with the base bid, we're not quite hitting the 20%, which is why we're not asking you to award the bid yet tonight. I still have to talk to our finance department and verify what, how to proceed. Uh, we'd, we'd still like to see if we can find a path forward for the project this year. Um, but we'll bring that to you on April 8th. If we do proceed with the project with a $486,000 city share, that would mean we would have to increase the debt levy by $31,600, which would be the equivalent of $1.58 on the current median value home. And so, again, as I said, our, we would like to consider awarding the bids on April 8th. And so we'll have an update for you at that time on what we think we can do for the financing. So again, the purpose of tonight's hearing is to receive any additional public feedback and then following the hearing to consider a resolution to order the improvements. So if you have any questions. Any, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, questions or comments for Mr. Trowbridge? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to comment on this public hearing? Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to comment on this public hearing? Seeing none, is there a motion to exit public hearing? So moved. Second. Motion made by Councilmember Paulson, seconded by Councilmember Duran. 
All in favor say motion. Please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Then is there a motion to approve the resolution in this matter? So moved. Motion made by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Duran. All in favor say motion. Please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Agenda item 13, <clears throat> excuse me, is a public hearing for 20th Avenue South and Center Square Street improvements. Engineering number 19-A2-10. And is there a motion to open the public hearing on this matter? Motion made by Councilmember Carlson, seconded by Councilmember Watson Curry. All in favor say motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. We are now in public hearing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so this is for 20th Avenue South and Center Square area. It's a project area that is between 8th Street and 11th Street uh, South and between the Concordia property and 20th Avenue South. <laughs> so these are streets that were initially constructed 1959 to 1963. There was a street rehabilitation project in 1996, and uh, although that was not, that did not include 20th Avenue South. And out there, the utilities, again, the sanitary sewer is, is pretty good condition. Uh, storm sewer is in good condition. The water main, most of the water main out there is cast iron pipe and needs to be replaced. There is a short segment that MPS replaced on 20th Avenue uh, from 20th Street to, or from uh, 10th Street to 11th Street about 10 years ago. But otherwise, all the other water mains out there are cast iron and will need to be replaced. And then this is another area. Sidewalks are inconsistent, although mostly they're good north-south. What they don't have is their... Uh, 18th Avenue and 19th Avenues don't have sidewalks and the real reason for that is they're very tight rights of way. The right of way for each of those streets was only 40 feet wide. And so the proposal is for a two inch bituminous mill and overlay from, for uh, some of the streets, the ones seen in green there. 18th Avenue uh, and 20th Avenue need the rehabilitation so we're doing a full pavement replacement there. And uh, we're not proposing to do any additional sidewalks at the present time, and that's based on the feedback that we received. And Moorhead Public Service will be replacing the cast iron water mains in advance of our project, so our contractor will coordinate with them to try to follow as quickly after them as they can. We do have one short segment of sanitary sewer to do, and what we're trying to do is it'll facilitate maintenance for us. In this area, the sewers, the sanitary sewers, are actually in the backyards. Uh, it's not that common we have that, but there were alleys originally platted, and the sewers were put there. In some ways, that's nice, because if someone has to dig it up, they're not digging up the street. On the other hand, it's kind of a pain maintenance-wise. We don't like to have to get back there if we don't have to. And what we're actually proposing to do, the sewer that's between 8th Street and 9th Street doesn't, the north manhole, is right next to a guy's garage. They didn't run it all the way to the right of way. And what we'd like to do is, is core, we'll, we'll do a directional bore to get to it so we don't have to dig up by his house, by his garage. But we'd like the manhole in the street so it's much easier for us to maintain. And so that's what we're looking at doing. And so we mailed the notice out to 17 property owners, and we did receive 15 responses back that they did not want us to do the sidewalk, and two people did not respond. So 88% uh, said no to the sidewalks, and so as a result, we will uh, cut the sidewalk, or it's not included in the final plans. So we did have a preliminary design informational meeting back in January. I would guess there were 10 or more residents from this neighborhood that came to that meeting. And they were very concerned that we were proposing to add sidewalks and that uh, they were organized and that led to the, the strong percentage that we got in response to the letter, I think, that we sent out on the sidewalks. 
And then there was some general concern, again, everybody about uh, how, how they get in and out of their driveways, what happens with mail and garbage, and, and we explained that to them. And then we had the mailed letter on the feedback for sidewalk plans, and then we mailed out a public hearing notice, and we had an informational meeting uh, last Thursday, and I think there were four or five people from this neighborhood that were at that informational meeting again. And mainly they were talking about where they were going to park during construction, and uh, it was actually suggested that you know maybe they'd be able to park in the Concordia parking lot if they needed to. And we'll contact Concordia and see if that's okay. But we, th you know, it, it's kind of a ways to the north. But if Concordia is okay with it and the residents want to do that, uh, I think we'll try to facilitate that for them. And then there was also a, a question about correcting some drainage at 20th Avenue and Center Square. And as it turns out, we had planned to put in a new storm sewer inlet at that location. We had identified that as a drainage problem as well. So that property owner is, is pretty happy that we're going to make it better. Um, and then there was just some general questions on uh, routine maintenance and when, when the city does seal coats and, and whether, you know, whether that cost was assessed, which it's not. The city just pays for those when it's necessary. So, and so the, uh, this project would be mill and overlay and rehab. So the assessment rates are $30 per foot and $61 per foot. Also, uh, 20th Avenue South is a collector street. It has a traffic signal at 8th Street. Uh, you know, so it, it is a little bit of a busier road. And since it's a collector, it has the collector assessment policy. In this case, the assessment area goes roughly from maybe 18th Avenue to 22nd Avenue. And so it's kind of where Concordia has their parking lot, I think, is what it would line up with. Okay, to the north. So the total assessment for this project is $228,000. The city share is about $612,000. And the assessments are per the policy. The average assessment would be about $3,500 for primary benefit. And, and that's for the ones that have the rehab. That was the biggest number. Uh, the $30,000 you see for the maximum, uh, I'm trying to remember which one that one was, but I would have thought that was. No. Oh, yeah, it's Con Concordia's property because they directly abut 18th Avenue, so they get a front footage assessment plus they have a fairly large area in the area wide, so their total assessment was $30,000. Otherwise, most of the assessments are quite a bit smaller than that. Uh, the median assessment was about $3,000. So summarizing this one, 27% of the project cost would be assessed, and the city share of $612,000 would require a debt levy increase of $39,800, which is just under $2 on a median value home. And so the project where we are at now, uh, so following this hearing, if you order the improvements, we've already advertised for bids. Uh, the council had previously approved the plans and specs and will receive bids on April 3rd. So hopefully we'll have a bid that uh, the council can award at the April 8th council meeting. And then construction would be this summer. So again, tonight you're holding the public hearing to receive any additional uh, public comment. And then following the hearing uh, to consider a resolution to order the improvements. So are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Trowbridge. <clears throat> Are there any uh, council members that have any questions, comments? Seeing none, is there anyone here in the audience that wishes to speak on this public hearing? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to speak on this public hearing? Seeing none, is there a motion to exit the public hearing? Motion made by Councilmember Watson Curry, seconded by Councilmember Dahlquist. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And now 
for 13A, is there a motion to approve the resolution to order the improvements? Second. Motion made by Councilmember Dahlquist, seconded by Councilmember White. All in favor say motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, item number 14 is, I believe, the last of our public hearings. <laughs> <clears throat> this is a public hearing for 28th Street North <coughs> Street Improvements Engineering Number 18-A2-02B. Is there a motion to go back into public hearing regarding item number four <laughs> made by Councilmember Carlson? Uh, Watson Curry, seconded by Councilmember Dahlquist as a team tonight. All in favor, I say motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Well, opposed, same sign. We're back in public hearing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so 28th Street North, uh, the project that we're looking at, uh, the improvements extend from Highway 10 to 15th Avenue North although most of the project is from Highway 10 to 8th Avenue North. And so, but uh, what includes beyond that, we are proposing to get a bike path connection between 8th Avenue and 15th Avenue North as well. That ties into a bike path that will be constructed this summer under a previously let contract for 15th Avenue North. So it uh, closes a nice gap in the system. The streets out here uh, were initially constructed 1993 from Highway 10 to 8th Avenue. The piece to the north of that was actually constructed in 99, I think it was, and so that's why it's not quite its time for a mill and overlay yet. Uh, so we'll be looking at that probably another five years. Uh, there haven't been any major maintenance projects since then. Um, and then sidewalks are kind of intermittent out here. And since it's a collector street, we definitely, we like to have a bike path along collector streets. Usually those end up having to be maintained by the public works department anyway because people don't have a lot of direct frontage. When their lots back up onto collector streets, it's more difficult getting snow maintenance done. And so if we have a bike path, the public works will plow it. And on collector streets, bike paths tend to be pretty desirable. So that's, that's what we're trying to do with this. Currently, there is an existing bike path from 6th to 8th Avenue, and there's really no other sidewalks out there right now. The intersecting streets, the side streets, do have sidewalks, so there's a lot of connectivity to this if we can get the bike path installed. Uh, utilities, uh, there were uh, some, some sewer was installed back in 1978 and 1992. Uh, but the utilities are generally pretty new, good condition, and there weren't any utility repairs that were needed. Uh, so what's proposed is a bituminous mill and overlay from Highway 10 to 8th Avenue North. And when I say 8th Avenue North, I'm referring to the right-of-way for what hasn't been built to the east. That was a former section line. When we actually built to the west, 8th Avenue North was moved a little north. So we're not going all the way to there because that's part of the newer pavement. Um, but uh, just, just so that might sound confusing otherwise. And it's the right time for a mill and overlay to maximize the life of the pavement. And we're proposing to have a continuous 10-foot trail uh, from Trunk Highway 10 to 2nd Avenue, and then from 4th Avenue to 15th Avenue. And in between, we'll have uh, pavement markings for bike lanes. And we, we can't yet fit a sidewalk between 2nd Avenue and 4th Avenue. The right-of-way is too cluttered up with between the ditch and the road that we have there. As the area on the west develops, we'll be trying to get a sidewalk in there uh, and work with the developments when that happens. There is currently a bridge over the ditch right at Highway 10, and that's why we're trying to squeeze in that bike path. It's complicated, but we can make it work. And 2nd Avenue is designated as an on-road bike facility. So that's one of the reasons we'd like to get that segment in. Um, and then otherwise, there's other sidewalks to the west along 4th Avenue and south, so that, that connects the, the rest of the trail well that way. But, so that's what we're proposing to do. 
Uh, the public input on this one has been a little bit different process because it's a collector street, so we, we didn't have, we don't usually get a lot of direct impact from residents and, and so what we just did was the mailed public hearing notice and, and we have not received much feedback on it. At the informational meeting on Thursday, we just had some questions really about the bike path location uh, and the design decisions leading to that. So this one, there is a little bit of direct abutting front footage that would get assessed. Uh, there's that uh, assisted living center, and there's a group of homes that have one shared driveway. Uh, and this is between 4th and 6th Avenue uh, on the east side of the road. Otherwise, it's an area-wide assessment, so most of the assessed dollars on this project come from the area-wide assessment. And it's got a pretty large area. It goes from Highway 75 to uh, approximately, it would be approximately 32nd Street. So, so there are seven properties that get the front footage assessment because their access is to it, and that's by the policy for a collector street. If they don't have a direct driveway access, they don't pay a front footage assessment they would only pay the area-wide assessment. So there's seven that get the front footage. Since that's also their collector, they get the front footage plus the area-wide assessment. So, uh, so those properties have the $500 plus the front footage part. And so there's a, as I said, it's a large assessment area. There's 198 total properties being assessed. And the since it's a $500 assessment for almost all of those, the median <coughs> assessment is $500. The average assessment is a little bit higher, uh, 1,350 total, and that's largely because the mobile home park has that largest assessment there, that $57,000, but they're also spreading that over a large number of units. So, but. <coughs> okay, so for this project, and this, this slide is based on the bids that we've received. And so allowing for contingencies and testing costs and our engineering costs, the total proposed project cost is $728,000. Out of that, we're assessing about 37% of the cost. The city share would be $461,000, which would result in a $30,000 debt levy impact which equates to a dollar fifty increase on the median value home taxes. And so the project uh, schedule for where we are, we received bids last Wednesday. We're holding the hearing now and following the hearing we'd like to order the improvements and award the bids. So again we're receiving any additional public input and then following that to consider ordering the improvements and awarding the bids. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> Excuse me, is there any questions or comments from Mr. Trobage? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to uh, comment regarding this public hearing? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to comment on this public hearing? Hearing none, is there a motion to exit the public hearing? Motion made by Councilmember Watson Curry, seconded by Councilmember Carlson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <clears throat> is there a motion to vote on the resolution, uh, 14A? Uh, motion made by uh, Councilmember Watson Curry, seconded by Councilmember Dahlquist. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. So now, B, item B. Correct. Is there a motion? to approve the resolution to award the bid. Second. Motion made by Council Member Carlson, seconded by Council Member White. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. 
Motion carries. Uh, item number 15 is a hearing regarding massage enterprise therapist license appeal. Okay, go ahead. And say the police department is here. I'm sorry? Point of order? Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor. There's a, I'll go over the procedure. This is a hearing before the council. This is the first time this council has had a hearing on an appeal of a license uh, application denial. Uh, when you hear uh, sit as a board listening to an appeal, it's a quasi-judicial action, so it's different than legislative. Uh, our ordinances provide that when the staff make a decision regarding the denial of a permit, uh, the applicant can within 10 days request an appeal before the city council. Uh, the city council can affirm the denial, it can grant, uh, or it could take some other action. Um, it's important to remember uh, that uh, it's not a public hearing, so not everybody from the public can come and present. Uh, the people presenting should be uh, members of the city uh, and the applicant and any witnesses that the uh, applicant wishes to call. Uh, the rules of evidence don't apply to these types of hearings, so they can submit whatever types of evidence they want to, whatever type of testimony. It just needs to be germane to uh, what's before the council. Um, following the, uh, we'll briefly go over the reason why the denial was made. Uh, then you'll want to have a motion to open the hearing. Uh, the police department will then present uh, why the investigation reached the conclusions it did. Then the applicant will have an opportunity to present uh, her side of the case. Uh, I would encourage you to ask as many questions as you want to. Uh, it's your, ap your opportunity to ask the witnesses for information. Uh, and then you'll want to close the hearing after all the evidence is presented. Uh, keep in mind, once the hearing is closed, it creates a bookend, so you have a beginning and an end, uh, and after the hearing is done, then you'll deliberate and make your decision. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it is not a criminal action, it's just a preponderance of evidence, so it's more likely than not, uh, and um, uh, you just need a majority of the quorum to make your decision. And so uh, the, I asked the clerk if she could just briefly go over why uh, the denial was recommended. Uh, then you'll want to open the uh, hearing uh, and have the police department present uh, their basis. And before Madam Clerk <clears throat> does that, I want to make sure, and the, as far as uh, the deliberation, uh, Mr. Shockley, is that done privately or is that out here? Out here. Okay, so make sure. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Um, the reason for the denial is we just had run into some issues with the background check that came in. Um, I guess I can just share a timeline, a brief timeline. Um, January 25th, Quinn Gong, the applicant, also known as Grace, came into our office in person with a completed renewal application um, for an enterprise therapist license. Um, while reviewing the application, I noticed that she had marked the um, box for having employees um, that are not covered by workers' compensation law on the certificate of compliance. Um, so I just asked her, you know, what the names of the employees were. Um, she had given me two names along with social security numbers and a home address. Um, the employees were listed as, and I apologize if I'm messing these names up, but Zhu Yane and Qing Sun. Um, as Ms. Gong completed the application at the counter, I just had verified the employees in our licensing database um, and found that neither of them were licensed in our system. Um, I spoke with Ms. Gong and notified her that as the enterprise license holder, it is her responsibility to verify that anyone doing massage in her business must be licensed. Um, she understood that and then changed her story that the two employees were not there, they were gone for the winter, um, not living there since one of them was pregnant, um, and they had actually gone back to China, um, so that she didn't want her employees hurting themselves in the winter months. Um, she then notified me that she would let them know that upon coming back into the country and into the city that they would need to file an application with the city of Moorhead when they returned. 
Um, on January 28th, I sent an email along with the application to Brad Penis and Corrine Lane at the Moorhead Police Department notifying them of the background that needed to be completed. Um, I also notified them of the conversation that had taken place and how the story had changed in person, um, just so that they had some background with that. February 13th, Detective Sean um, Krebsbach emailed me regarding the background check, which raised some questions um, with some findings on that. Um, so just questions raised regarding renewing the license. March 5th, the city clerk's office sent a certified letter to Ms. Gong notifying her of the application denial. Um, March 6th, she was, uh, Ms. Gong asked to be granted a hearing before the city council. And March 6th and March 13th, the city clerk's office notified Ms. Gong of the meeting date, time, and location of today's meeting. So just a timeline of events there. Is there a motion to open the appeals hearing? So moved. Motion made by Council Member White, seconded by Council Member Dahlquist. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, I think because this is the first time we've had a hearing of this nature, and I'll defer, uh, Mr. Shockley, uh, would it be better, so three minutes, or how do we? Um, so, so first you'd want to have the police uh, go and present. Uh, there is no time limitations. Uh, when it's a hearing regarding the license, it's important to give the applicant enough time to present their side of the case. Obviously, if they're repeating themselves over and over, uh, then you can tell them to wrap it up. But And so, <clears throat> and just so procedurally, just so we're clear, law enforcement has their side, the appellant has their side, and then that's it, or is there a rebuttal? Um, it, it, you could have rebuttal, but my experience is it's, only if, if the council is asking questions as you go through uh, to judge the credibility of the witnesses and the evidence, you generally don't need a rebuttal. Okay. Uh, you certainly can allow it, but it, it, it would only be if the police department wanted to go after the applicant. So. Okay, fair enough. And then you'd want to give the applicant another opportunity to respond. Okay, fair enough. All right. So that being said, uh, Chief Monroe, Thank you, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> in a few minutes, you're gonna hear from an investigator with the Moorhead Police Department about what challenges that we face in uh, not only doing background investigations on, on uh, these types of businesses, but in doing compliance checks types of investigations. Um, and you're gonna hear information that um, is gonna discuss specifically the kind of complaints that we've received. Um, what evidence that we were able to gather and particularly what violation um, occurred in this in this situation. The reason why I wanted to go first here also and speak with you is to let you know that um, this is a nationwide problem. I get daily bulletins from the International Association of Chiefs of Police and across the nation they're having issues with um, massage parlors and things that go on um, at some of these places. Um, some of those uh, communications have stated things from uh, uh, human trafficking to prostitution type cases. Um, you're probably familiar with a recent headline with uh, Robert Kraft, the owner of the New England Patriots that was in that type of, uh, of a business. I wanna be clear here that we do not have evidence in this case that that is what's happening here, um, but I just wanted to point out that um, this is a nationwide issue and that's why we wanna pay particularly close attention to um, our licensing process um, for these kind of businesses. <clears throat> Um, we really do not get complaints on uh, massage businesses um, where there has been the staff that work at them that have received their licensure, their training through one of the local um, 
training centers or organizations. When I say local, I mean North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota kind of thing. Um, it's very easy for us to uh, verify the training and credentials of the people that um, ap apply for a, a permit here um, because they are a more local or regional place. Um, where we do have some serious challenges is when people come from um, states and states away from here. And the reason why that's a challenge for us is because some states don't have a very high standard on what would be considered a training center where somebody can become licensed. So um, specifically, we run into some out of California where uh, the business for training uh, a masseuse is open one day, closed the next. There's poor record keeping. Um, it's very hard for us from across the country to verify those credentials. Um, then when we work investigations in compliance check type of situations, we only do that basically based upon um, the fact that we've received repeated um, complaints from uh, na neighboring businesses or from citizens um, out in the, in the general public. They demand a lot of resources from um, our office, um, and they usually only result in misdemeanor type um, cases if it was something that we found a violation that would be a violation of criminal law. And as you can imagine, um, in working those kind of cases, that also puts our staff, our plain clothes staff, in some pretty uncomfortable situations. So they're not the kind of cases that, that obviously we, we want to be um, working. So again, I want to state I'm not saying that that's what's gone on in this case. Uh, Detective Krebsbach is going to give you what information that he's received in complaints and what he's found, um, and you'll be able to ask him uh, questions. What I'm hoping for at the end of this hearing is that the very clear violation that has occurred is that I would ask that you um, uphold these very basic rules that we have for, for governing these kind of businesses um, to set a precedent and give us that tool to uh, be able to be sure we don't have, um, I guess, something less desirable uh, come into town and be operating here. So at that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Detective Krebsbach, but I'll also be available for questions. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Detective? Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, so this particular business I'm very um, familiar with. I did the initial background when this business tried to open as Seasons Relaxation Spa, um, exact same location in 2017. Um, I went through the background at that point. Um, the two names that attempted to open it were the same names that you heard from the clerk earlier, um, Mr. Sun and Ms. Yang. Um, they had attempted to open this facility. And completing the background, luckily I was able to share some records from our neighbors uh, to the west. Um, you know, had they not been here in another area in the state, I wouldn't have had access to this, but we share the same record system. Um, they had received complaints at that time of possible prostitution. They tried to go through and interview um, the people that were operating that business in Fargo at that time. Uh, when they went to go follow through with that, they kind of vanished, went back to California as the information that we had and closed up shop. Um, six months later, November of 17 is when they come and attempt to open this business in Moorhead. Um, I interviewed them, found other discrepancies, lies, uh, that they hadn't provided this information to me, that they had any police contact. Um, within six months ago, I believe at that time, they told me they had forgot. Um, we went through the denial um, and they were refused a permit to open this business in town. Um, in April of 2018, Ms. Gong came here to open this exact same business. Um, when I say open the same business, I say the same decor, the same sign that's on the outside that still reads Seasons Relaxation Spa, not Seasons Spa, in which it is called today, um, and even took the exact same apartment as the original tenants had rented. Um, the investigation had went through at that time. Um, it was completed by one of my partners. Um, and there were, there were concerns, it was approved. Um, questions were raised to Ms. Gong at that time as to um, if she understood why um, these other individuals who she says were her friends uh, were denied their license. She said um, they were denied, she didn't know that they were denied their license, simply that they had been having family pressures to go have children, so they had left our community. Um, she was informed by the other investigator at that time 
that uh, that was not the case and that this was an issue uh, with unlicensed workers, uh, which had been confirmed in Fargo as well. Um, and just to make sure that we stress that any person that worked there needed to have a license, especially in our city. Uh, fast forward, I had been receiving some other complaints from other businesses um, around the area. Uh, one of those complaints was that the original owner was back there working um, with Ms. Gong. Um, I had conducted some surveillance, noted that there are two people working there, um, and this kind of had progressed from the end of 2018 to early January of 2019. Um, I hadn't been able to figure out who the extra or the second employee was, um, just knew that there were two people leaving. Uh, we had received the uh, license renewal from the clerk's office around this exact same time and decided to kind of work these together in unison to figure out who was exactly working at this facility um, and if there were anything uh, else that we could deal with by just simply going in. Um, on the February 11th of 2019, we conducted a compliance check. Um, in these compliance checks, what I found out um, from my past experience in these cases is that we simply need to go in and get a massage or act like we are going to. Um, if we go in and try and just do permit checks, uh, we receive a lot of, uh, I guess it's not, not cooperating, but it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to communicate. Um, and, and to get a truthful statement is very challenging. So uh, we go in, a uh, partner and I, we go in to have these massages done at the exact same time. Um, we go in, there's two individuals ready to perform massages on each of us. Uh, we had already known at that point that there's only one person that's licensed, Ms. Gong, who is the enterprise license holder for that facility. Um, so therefore, the other individual working is not licensed in our city. We talked with them. Ms. Gong says she's doing on-the-job training. She admitted that that's not the way things are done here, and she knows that. Um, and, and, and did understand at that point. So um, other than that, our communication that day was, was fine. Uh, we didn't have any other problems. But uh, like I said, she was working in there without a license. So. <clears throat> so Detective, pretty much I'm just looking at what was um, filed uh, with the communication with Mayor and Council. So pretty much what you're saying is based on the information in your investigation regarding the licensure, there's, there's prima facie evidence that there's code violations here. Yeah, and, and we believe that, uh, you know, Miss Yang is possibly has been working there. Um, you know, the person that had originally tried to open this place. Um, Ms. Gong had stated that she has been back in the area. There's some discrepancy of whether or not she um, was actually working there. Um, it, but we couldn't confirm that. But I mean, still, the bottom line is you found that there's violations of the Moorhead City Code. Yes, yes, okay. sir. Anyone have any questions for Detective Kresbach? Councilmember Paulson. Detective, thank you. I have a question about the the actual. Um, licenses that uh, that these individuals get is there some sort of national board that's uh, has some standards as far as these license and if not um, what are what are we requesting as far as license documentation so we are one of the states that do not have a state licensure board so um, like Chief Monroe said when these backgrounds come in um, the entirety of confirming everything is correct is on the police department on the local municipalities so you know our North Dakota has a state licensure board we don't um, so it, it becomes challenging uh, we have requirements you know through the city that we list in our city codes and uh, you know we've tried to morph those from ones that we've seen um, but it, it is very challenging to confirm everything that is um, completed and truthful uh, especially with colleges. Colleges are very, very difficult um, in these other states to confirm. Um, many, many of them are under review. They're not, you know, currently being um, seen as certified, but they're not not certified. So uh, it, that brings up a whole lot of other challenges in these backgrounds. 
And just to follow up on that, thank you for the response. Uh, if if you were to be uh, reviewing one of these licenses uh, and it was unable to determine um, to your satisfaction, I'm assuming it's to the, the police department's satisfaction, um, would you deny the the application? I haven't had that instance. Most of them I can find the school. Uh, whether or not I believe that that school is in good standing or has merit is a completely different thing. Um, you know, I, I don't have the ability to go to California, Colorado, or these other t um, states to verify that they actually are there. Um, so I have to use the uh, tools at my disposal, if you will, to try and confirm these as much as possible. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Does that raise any uh, further questions for Detective Kresbach? Councilmember Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Detective, how, how long did you, would you say you spent on this? On the, doing a background or just yeah, a background, complete everything. investigation? Everything. Uh, at times, it, eight months. I mean, going. I, I can't work on them daily. This is um, something, obviously, I have much more higher priorities um, to the citizens and taking care of cases. So um, I try and complete these in a timely manner for the applicant. Um, because I feel like we, we obviously owe that to them. Um, but they can be very, very time consuming, especially going back and to do uh, permit verifications and permit checks, orchestrating that with my partners and going back through it. It's extremely time consuming. But you know, with that length of time, eight months, so what you're telling me is there, you had to dig quite a bit because you couldn't find the information. Correct. And, and when I go, when I say eight months, that could be when I'm receiving citizen complaints and trying to verify that information and trying to determine what we can do and what we can go forth from those complaints. Um, and uh, that's not all spent just doing background, you know. Right. So. But in your opinion, it was hard to find information. They're very difficult, yes. Okay, thanks. Councilmember White. I just wondered, can, is there any additional information that you can share with us about the complaints that we've received that you've received um, yeah so I've received complaints um, traditionally the hours I think were some of the issues uh, I think they're open usually like 13 hours a day um, the people that are working there miss um, gong I believe is the person that's there that entire time um, we also had additional complaints that it's only male clients um, typically North Dakota plates of individuals that are showing up um, and we did have one instance where a male was seen carrying a box of condoms into this facility. And like I said, those are simply complaints that we had received. I hadn't, uh, aside from all males in North Dakota license plates, I didn't confirm, I, I didn't see the condoms myself. It was simply a complaint. So. Any other questions for Detective Krebsbach? Thank you for your information, Thank you. sir. Uh, Ms. Gong, yeah. please approach the podium. Thank you. And then, uh, and I want to apologize. So your first name again? Uh, Ching. Ching? Female here. Okay. Mm. Ching Gong. Mm. Okay. Thank you. You may proceed. Uh, you may talk or oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mayor Jar and City Council members, for let me speak to you today. I'm responding to a letter of March 15, 2019, from the City of Mohead, denying a new renewal for the license to the season relaxation spa on 30th Avenue South. The reason given was twofold, and I would like to respond to each separately. My hope here is that uh, I can demonstrate that uh, I have a reputable business and uh, <clears throat> that I can be granted a license renewal. The first reason it, uh, cited <clears throat> in the letter for denying a license renewal is that there were complaints, complaints of the <clears throat> Suspiciously activity at my spa that were uh, inappropriate, inappropriate <clears throat> to business standards and uh, practice. Uh, I can assure you that uh, 
when I was heard about this, I fired this employee immediately. This kind of practice is something I neither want nor to tolerate, and it gave a, a legitimate massage and a bad report, reputation. I educate my employees and the to proper business practice and the, the staff, the <clears throat> consequence is if they do not follow them. <laughs> Sorry for my voice. <clears throat> the second reason given in the letter is that one employee who worked in the shop was unlicensed, uh, unlicensed and uh, <clears throat> that she was going to give a uh, on the uh, undercover policeman a massage. When the policeman asked me if she had a training, <clears throat> I misunderstood uh, uh, and uh, said she didn't. While Ms. Han, uh, which is uh, the employee, had a certification from a school of massage and a required, uh, required number of hours for more head lessons, uh, we were just getting around to applying for a lessons. Uh, in the end, uh, that was my fault. Thought I mistaken understood that she could work in there while applying for a license. Again, <clears throat> I accept a full responsibility for this oversight. However, I do not believe it warrants closing down my business. I have heard uh, that another who didn't have a massage license did not uh, <clears throat> get their license granted, but uh, that the shop itself uh, was put on notice. My hope is that uh, the police will <clears throat> uh, apply here also. I have tried to be upright member of the Mohead business community, and while I should have no better <laughs> to have my one employee certificate before letting her work at my spa, my hope is that is uh, this ruling can be over, uh, overturned and. Uh, I be giving a second chance for a business lesson, renewal in separate uh, spite of uh, this oversight. Thank you for hear, uh, hearing me out. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions, questions. for Ms. Gong? I, I have one question. You mentioned that after there were um, some complaints about misconduct that you fired an employee? Yeah, Can you immediately. What did you fire that employee for? So what did that employee do for that you fired her for? Actually, uh, in our store rule, it's like whenever you're doing massage, we're not allowed to closing the door uh, totally. So we have to leave in at least one box in the space and then for skips some of the uh, on, on, I mean, under the law, something is like uh, illegal, something, but uh, still, uh, you know, we, it's like uh, really hard to control everybody. So, uh, I mean, if I hear from another customer complaining about this girl maybe working not really well, I, I fire her that day. So for not close, for, because she closed the door? No, because of she, maybe she doing or she asking something is like uh, for she want to working for more tips or something she trying to get it and uh, <clears throat> she asking the customer to uh, if she uh, if she do more she can get more tips or not but uh, this thing is not allowed to happen in our store and then that's why I fire her so these were complaints in addition to the complaints that the detective brought up yeah, it's from another customer to, told me because he uh, she, she working with him before, so I fired her immediately. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but these were for additional yeah improprieties but, uh, beyond the, what the, the customer that time she, he told me he didn't apply, so okay. uh, I don't know if he's a liar me or not. But uh, when he told me this information, I let her go immediately. Councilmember Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Ma'am, mm -hmm. when you initially applied in January, is that correct? For the renewal, um, there was 
apparently misunderstanding that they wanted you to give, you gave two names with social securities and addresses and then you said that they weren't. So can you explain to me why having that knowledge that the city needed to know every time somebody new was working for you, that you didn't report that then? Oh, the reason why, because I misunderstood. Actually, the, on that December, I was going back to New, the New York for accounting to reporting the tax, uh, uh, I mean, to finance, finance my tax, some, something. So <clears throat> because this uh, store, I bought from the Chang Sun and uh, uh, the, the lady, uh, the, I know her in English name is Jennifer. I bought from that, that couple. <clears throat> And then uh, during the December, I also paying her some money back for uh, payback money because of uh, I purchased this store. And then in this case, she also <coughs> uh, put some tax on the uh, our store the tax tax rule. So uh, that's why I thought because she reported tax here, I have to tell you guys. Uh, because I gave in some money from uh, to them, so I have to tell you guys. Yes, that that's, that's uh, she working for me. Actually, from the sons, uh, last April, they already. I uh, mean, when I taking over this store, they already went back to China because that time she uh, the the couple of the female she was pregnant, and then actually she just have a baby last month. But I thought because I gave her some money, so I have to put her on the list to let you guys know she, she as my one of the employees, which is I misunderstood. Sorry for that. The tax reason. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments for Ms. Gong? Council Member Pauls. Thank you, Ms. Gong. Um, can you please uh, explain to me what sort of internal protocol that you have at your business to ensure that your um, employees are licensed? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't well, understand. Sorry, sorry uh, about I, the, for my language. No, that's okay. Uh, uh. What I believe Council Member Paulson is asking uh. is within your business, mm -hmm. do you have certain rules? or guidelines where you check to make sure that your employees are licensed to do that work? Actually, yeah, before that I was checking, but the thing with like, <clears throat> actually I know why I get a complaint. The reason why, because uh, <clears throat> one of my another preview partner, we also have another store located in Bismarck, okay? <clears throat> Um, we have that some problem in the Bismarck. Uh, I'm already calling the police on the February 2nd, so which is because she stolen my money. And you can check the police report, no problem on the Bismarck. <clears throat> in this case, because I need to deal something with there, so uh, I letting the Miss Han because Miss Han have qualified the 500 uh, the hours. Uh, I mean the. Uh, study background already, which is uh, requested by the Mohead, I thought, okay, maybe she can work in here or not, <clears throat> because I have something to deal with the Bismarck. So that's why she is working, she is working there, she was working there. <clears throat> and then when the police coming, because of that things happened to me, it's like, <laughs> because they stolen <laughs> too much money on me. <clears throat> so I and my mind is like not really clearly. <clears throat> so I misunderstood. When they're asking, she have the license? Yes, no. That because she not yet decided she want to work in there or not. And then <clears throat> uh, the, uh, she asked me, did the, uh, the police ask me, did she have the school, the background or something? I, I, I don't, I asking the, <clears throat> my employee, maybe something misunderstood between the, our language. She told me no. I thought, oh, I said, uh, <clears throat> I told the police no. But after that, when I check her file, I found she has the, <clears throat> she, she really, really have. she thought it's like the high school background, not the certification of the, the massage school. We misunderstood the information. And also, it's my fault. I should totally understand what the police said, but at that time, because that's a really heavy 
bad, bad things happen to me, so I cannot keep clearly. So, so you don't have any formal control. I, I just uh, make sure she has the qualified the 500 the, uh, study background already, uh, which is more highly required, and then. <clears throat> I gonna I gonna, I want her to to check to she applying, but uh, that that time we didn't because she just go there like uh, two days something, uh, just a week. She not yet decide she wanna work in there or not. I'm not yet decide I wanna hire her or not. I, she there because just because I need to deal something in the base mark. She kindly come for help and she can qualify the 500 the <clears throat> Study experience, and then when she wanna, uh, when the police asked me, I totally misunderstand. As, and she, because she thought the police asking the high school or something, the, the background, I, I that, that, that's what I told her because I misunderstood. So I told her the police, no, she don't have it. So, so I, I guess to be more clear, I asked what kind of controls, how do you ensure that your people are in, licensed to give massages? Because you do understand mm -hmm. to give a massage in the city of Moorhead, you have got to be licensed. Yes, I totally understand. Uh, but the thing is, like, uh, I miss, uh, I have a mistake. It's like, uh, I thought that people, if they qualify, if they, it's like, uh, if they no, don't have any the study experience, they not work at the store at all. I understand. But I thought it's like, if they qualify just applying, I mean, uh, maybe they can work in there. I mean, it's like uh, that's two different ways, uh, which is I already make a mistake before. So uh, in the future, I will not happen. I will, when the people, the employee want to work in on that store, they're going to be applying for first. But uh, <clears throat> before I misunderstood, I thought it's like if they qualify for applying, yeah, maybe they can <clears throat> like uh, try to practice or whatever training the thing. That's what I misunderstood. Uh, no further questions, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member White. If I could just follow up on that. So you, you are running this business. <laughs> yeah. And you knew that, that all of the massage therapists had to be licensed. And you wanted to, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. You, want, you have this person who you're thinking of hiring and she's thinking of going into massage therapy. And so you let her practice massage therapy at your facility. That's, it, it, so let me just verify, is that, that part correct? Actually, uh, all the employees come to my store, not if they want to work, they can work, no. I have to make sure everything is like uh, under the rule. It's like I have to check. So. Uh, so, so skip some something mm -hmm. happened. I mean, something under the law happened. Yeah. So I, I have to uh, give them this like uh, that time. Actually, she shouldn't work in that time. But uh, because something happened in the Mohead, no, some, something happened in Bismarck. Mm -hmm. So I have to handle. That's why <clears throat> that time she uh, she work on me. We are working together. If uh, otherwise, she cannot work in there. Uh, Besides, she have the lessons. And actually, before, it's like uh, we just need one people <laughs> there. We're not really busy because we, uh, we are the new store. Mm -hmm. So I hire her because she because something happened in the Bismarck. So I need somebody for help. And then she also qualified for the 500 the, the study experience. And then uh, the, the last thing is like uh, I have to make sure she can give a good massage so she can work in there. <clears throat> So that's why I thought it's like uh, maybe something wrong with my, my mis misunderstood. It's like she cannot work in even practice. She cannot also. So, <clears throat> but I, I, I don't really either. Got it. I thought maybe she can work in like one day or two days. If she cannot work in, I'm going to fire her also because uh, I don't want any trouble. And I also care about our store credit. I mean, I don't want to give any bad experience for our customer. But uh, I guess my part of what I'm trying to get at is you were the responsible party because you are the owner of the company. And if you, you had this woman here and you 
didn't verify that she had the appropriate license, right? Uh -huh. But you yeah. wanted to give her a chance, and you didn't make a, an effort to contact the city to see if there was a, a way of doing that temporarily, and you just you allowed her to work. Um, and now you're sorry that you made the mistake, but it, but and you were, and you're now saying that you would have fired her, but it was your decision to do this, knowing that she was required to have a license. Uh, actually, I, I, I mean, the, she, she actually is trying to apply in the Mohead license also, even right now. I did ask Christina if she can or not, because uh, she decided to work in here. And then, yes, I did a mistake. It's like I thought she can work in there if she has the 500 uh, <coughs> the study experience, mm -hmm. and then <coughs> give her a chance to, see, to check she would like working there or not. That's my mistake. And then <clears throat> the thing is, like, she didn't work in there for a long time. And then I need, I need her working there because just because something happened in uh, my another place. <clears throat> so I really need somebody for help me that time. So, yeah, it's my mistake. <clears throat> Councilmember Carlson. Mr. Yeah. Mayor, could I ask Detective Kresbach? Follow-up question, mm -hmm. uh, Detective. When you and your partner went to the massage, one second, Miss Gong, if you uh, can slide over, oh. so Detective Krasbach can speak okay. up. On February 11th, when you did the compliance check, were you told that the person there was an intern? Uh, yeah, that she was doing on-the-job training. Okay, so but. it wasn't your understanding that this was somebody from Bismarck coming to, who was licensed in Bismarck, coming to work for Miss Gong and just hadn't gotten her license yet in Moorhead? Correct, and I had specifically asked her if she had ever gone to school. She said no. Miss Gong? Yes. Do you have any follow-up based on the question that Miss Carlson asked Detective Kresbach? Sorry, do, you, do, you, do you want to respond to that? Oh. You don't have to. I'm just asking if you want no. to, you can. Okay, I want to thank you. And uh, <clears throat> that time I told you because something happened on me that's really, really big trouble on me. And then she did ask me, is that Miss Han go to the school? I thought, I told you, I thought it's like the high school or, or the university, something. Sorry for my English. And at that time, I cannot clearly because uh, <clears throat> somebody stole my money on the base market. So I, I misunderstood, so I gave the wrong information to them. It's my fault. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Councilmember Paulson. Ms. Gong, are, mm -hmm. you, are you the owner of this establishment? Yeah. Okay. Sole owner? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I guess the, I only have comments, Ms. Gong. Uh, oh. <clears throat> thank you for bringing your appeal to us. Uh, you know, I think it's important, and I have got some experience in explaining this to people, that having a license, mm -hmm. like a massage license, mm -hmm is a privilege and what then what I mean by that is it's something that you don't necessarily have to have you do you understand what I'm saying it's not like a right like you know we have certain rights that we have mm -hmm. like you have the right to have an appeal hearing mm -hmm. uh, you don't necessarily have a right to have a massage license do you, do you understand that Mm, not really got it. Sorry for my English. It's not something that you can automatically have. Thank you. Oh. Do, do, do you understand that? Yeah. And what I mean by that is you're not denying the fact that the officers violated you because of the code violations. So, so you're in essence admitting that you were in violation of these codes. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. I need help. Uh, what, what is that? I guess I'll, I'll try to reword. Mm -hmm. 
You received the sheet of paper mm -hmm. as to why your license Denied. was not renewed, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Okay. And, and you read that, the letter, the letter that's dated March 5th? March 5th, yeah. Yep. You, you read that letter? Uh, actually, my English is limited. I can't speak and hearing. I mean, I cannot read and writing. So that's why I need uh, this letter actually writing down by my friend, what I told him what happened, and then he reading the letter, and then it's plan for me. Did your I friend, appreciate it, yeah. Did your friend read the letter to you? Yeah, already. Okay. Is that your did, did you read the letter, sir? It wasn't me. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. The point I'm getting at is, mm -hmm. if the police found mm -hmm. that you were in violation, like mm -hmm. you, you broke the rules, mm -hmm. are you admitting that you broke those rules? Are you saying that, that you knew that you were breaking the rules regarding your license? Does that make sense? Make a, uh, okay. Like, that you made a mistake. All these mistakes that, that you're saying you made, Mm -hmm. You're admitting that to us right now that you made those mistakes. Yeah. And that's the reason why the city denied your license. Yeah. You're agreeing to that? That's why I'm here to try to get another chance. Right. Yeah. But, but, but my point is, is that mm -hmm. do you, you understand that why the police officers were concerned about your business? Do you understand that? Why they were concerned? Uh, do you understand why they were showing up at your business? Do you understand why? Actually, when the police call me, I'm not very surprised because I was calling the police in the Bismarck also because somebody stole my money. And then I know her husband can call the police for complaint too. <laughs> No, not a surprise. So you weren't surprised that the police were showing up at your business? Yeah, because she kind of calling the police off, also. So that's why right now I'm hiring an attorney for suiting them. So that means that you knew mm. that there were concerns at your business in Moorhead? Yeah. Okay. I know that. Okay. Because we have the police report on the Bismarck, which is, if you want, you can check. No problem. Okay. I have no further comments or questions. Is that raise anything for anyone else? Okay. Is there a motion to wait? We cannot close yet because it has to be deliberation, correct? Uh, or do Mr. you close Mayor, the evidence portion? Yeah, you close the hearing and then uh, the council deliberates and you make your decision. Okay. Can I, is there, if we, um, can we ask questions of, our city attorney. Sir, oh, well, uh, or, during, yeah, abs absolutely. You can ask either during the deliberations or during the evidentiary time. I would say let's close the evidentiary portion so we can move forward. So is there a motion to close the evidentiary portion of this hearing? So moved. So moved. Second. A uh, motion made by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member White. All in favor say motion. Please signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Ms. Gong, thank you for your, uh, your words, your statement. Well, you can have a seat, and I think at this point what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what we heard, mm -hmm. and then we'll make a decision on that, okay? Appreciate it. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Council Member White, did you have any questions for um, City Attorney Shockley? I guess if there's any background we could get on um, precedents or what, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm even thinking, I'm not, since I'm new to the, in terms of the appeal process or what um, things are in there to deny an appeal or any, any other additional information like that that you might be able to provide in terms of city policy. Certainly, uh, we don't have any direct uh, city policy regarding decisions by the city council. Uh, what I can tell you from court precedents is the courts review any type of challenge to a city council decision uh, that is made uh, in the role as a quasi-judicial, did you correctly apply the law to the facts? And so you've heard the facts. 
uh, the law in our ordinances is clear that if there are violations, um, the denial is appropriate. Uh, in this case, uh, you have heard evidence that the applicant admits that there were issues regarding having unlicensed operators there. Uh, also, there is a, a strong policy, and I think the police department tried to touch upon that, uh, that these types of businesses are prone, unfortunately, to human trafficking issues. Uh, so there's a strong overriding policy of uh, regulating these types of agencies. I can tell you uh, from my experience when we look at whether or not to grant or deny these types of uh, licenses, uh, I'm usually involved in it. Uh, we, when we review the type of certification or the education, of the uh, people that are working at these uh, places. Uh, we typically are fairly forgiving about the type of education. There's been many times that we've received uh, grades uh, and certificates from uh, universities or colleges, at least they call themselves universities or colleges, uh, from California and Denver, and we accept those. And so it's a fairly easy threshold. Uh, we don't actually send anybody out to make sure there's a physical building out there uh, that they're actually taking the courses. So in this standpoint, it's fairly easy. They didn't, they didn't have people who were qualified working there giving massages. Uh, there's clearly an overriding policy that as a city, we don't want that occurring at massage uh, parlors. And the part that I wanted to go back to, to just because this is what I was looking for, is that you said it, in the policy it has that um, if there's a confirmed violation, it's grounds for denial. Correct. Thanks. Councilmember Paulson. Mr. Shockley, I, I'm just, you know, I, I'm actually a little bit um, concerned about our processes of um, verifying and um, accepting um, this documentation and. Um, you know, I'd actually maybe like to take a look at that and see if we could strengthen those laws a little bit. I think it's uh, not fair for us to expect the police department to try to sift through all this information to try to figure out what's real and what's not, and then leave that on their table to have to make that decision. Um, I think there should be maybe some clear guidance. I just did a quick Google search and it appears that there are a number of nationally recognized um, therapeutic massage um, um, agencies that do provide some credentials to um, higher ed facilities that maybe might be teaching these things. Um, but I don't know how much work that the city's actually done in preparing the ordinance that we currently do have. Um, but maybe we could take a another look at that and see if there's some options to provide some additional checks and balances uh, for um, these sorts of situations so the police department isn't required to make uh, decisions on their own. Well, and, and if I, I could, uh, it's a great question, Council Member Paulson. One of the issues we have in the police department highlighted is uh, that many of the schools that teach this will open and then close within a few months or years. And so you have transcripts from a college or university, usually a private college or university, uh, that is given a certificate or diploma. They're closed. It's hard, I mean, even, even when we have that evidence in hand, it's hard to dispute that, well, did you really get an education without sending an investigator out there to see if there was real uh, professors, if there was real instructors. Uh, and also, so that we've tried to do spot checks because you can have somebody working at a business and not know if they're licensed or not because you're depending upon the applicant reporting those. And so you're always going to have some spot checks to make sure and uh, checking to see if the person has the appropriate uh, licensure, licensures and uh, certifications is an easy way to check uh, compliance. And um, we could certainly check into if there's uh, different verification systems throughout the country, but um, it's been our experience, and we've been doing this for many years, is that it's the real problem is the colleges and universities in California and you know states that they open and then they close, and we it's very hard for us to go back and disprove that that wasn't a legitimate school. 
Well, there's, I mean, with other licensed trades and industries, there's a certain level of certification. And you're telling me there's no level of certification for massage therapists? Because there are states that require Correct. licensing, right? And we just don't have a board, but you, like you mentioned, North Dakota does. So this board in North Dakota must have some requirements of information that needs to be submitted to them for them to approve somebody to work in the state, right? Correct. And, and from a, a state statute standpoint, uh, if our legislators wanted to take up creating such a board, that would make our job much, much easier. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to get to the root of the issue is that the state's not doing anything about this issue and it's leaving it entirely on the local government for us to have to deal with this, this certain circumstance. And it's requiring us to spend a lot of time and resources um, to be able to verify these and investigate cases where we have concern. Um, so I'm just looking for some additional way here locally for us to maybe consider some things that would strengthen um, and give the police department a little bit more guidance that they can, and the city, that can then in turn um, require of applicants that would like to open a business here. So. My thought and I'm, I obviously don't have a vote, but what, what, what I will say this, uh, just so give counsel a little bit to think about as we make our decision, or your decision. Uh, Officer Krebsbach spent eight, eight months on this investigating uh, this situation. I think that's more than enough time and the resources that he's spent and the department has spent to investigate this matter. I personally, sitting up here from listening to him, Unless anyone has any dispute, I found his uh, his uh, statements to be credible. Uh, I find that he uh, has done his due diligence. This isn't something that came up two weeks ago. Uh, it has been an eight-month process. Uh, Ms. Gong, uh, with all due respect, she has uh, had a license. She's been in this uh, business for uh, apparently quite some time. You know the rules, correct? Okay. And she's admitted that in her own uh, testimony, she made mistakes. Uh, in this day and age, Ms. Gong, uh, individuals who own these businesses are held to a much higher standard now. Uh, communities now, at this point in time, there's a lot to juggle, there's a lot going on. I think that your statements are credible, that you made honest mistakes, but these are things that, I mean, you know the rules. You've had a license for a while, correct? Okay. And so you, you, you know the rules, you, you know the code, and those mistakes, in my opinion, sitting up here, I don't have a vote, but they're not excusable. And I say that with the utmost respect, I know you're a business owner, however, if you had knowledge that these things, that these, these incidents or these allegations or, you know, if you know that there were wrongdoings that were, might be going on, you probably could have taken some action right away to fix it. So, I mean, I don't know if anyone wants to move forward with a vote in this matter, or if you have any comments you want to add in your deliberation, but that's why I said. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, Mr. Shockley, what would be the wording that we would need to use? Uh, if you want to affirm uh, the denial, you would make a motion to confirm the denial. Uh, if you want to grant the license, you would make a motion to grant the license. So I move to affirm the denial. A second. Motion has been made by Councilmember Carlson, seconded by Councilmember White. Councilmember Duran. One one quick question before we vote: uh, When? Would the business owner be able to reapply for a license, or is she able to reapply for a license at any point in time in the future? Um, she will be able to reapply in the future. Uh, I don't have it off off the tip of my fingers, but I want to say it, it, it'll it's a little while before you can reapply, but it's not forever. So. Right, right. Less than a year. I want to. I, w I was thinking year. six months. I I'll, I can double check and okay. send that out to uh, the but it, So it's not it, it's not forever. Correct, and in fact, Minnesota has a statute that um, it applies to criminal convictions, but you're supposed to give opportunities to people who have been previously convicted, and you look at the time and the nature of the offense, and, and here 
it is a license violation that's administrative in nature. Um, so you would, you would, as a council, you would, you would obviously take it under consideration uh, if, you know, if it was a severe denial, like there was activities in there and that were clearly wrong and on, at a large, at a significant criminal liability standpoint, then you might wait a few more years before you prove it, but. Thank you. So Ms. Gong, just so you are aware, uh, so what we're talking about is <clears throat> if the council, there is a motion now to de uh, affirm the denial of your license or denial of your appeal. Do you understand that? Okay. What we're, there's a motion on the table that we are going to affirm your, your denial or the denial of your appeal. Do you understand what that means? You're, you, you, you can come up, ma'am. You can come up. I'm only, I know there may be a language barrier because we're kind of talking, but I just want to, I want to let you know. So in essence, there's a vote right now that we're going to affirm, meaning we're going to say that what the law enforcement, they deny, or the city denied your license and you have appealed it, that that's why you're here tonight? Yeah. There's a vote that we're going to pretty much say it's okay for the city to deny your license. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and what we're talking about is, if this vote goes through, you will have to wait a while to come back again to get a license. Does that make sense? Yes, this makes sense. Actually, it's like, oh, the only thing I feel terrible is like, uh, because these things happened, uh, I mean, uh, during the January and the February something, because when, whenever I, something happened on Bismarck, I already prepared for something gonna be happened in Moorhead, uh, mm -hmm. prepare for myself. But uh, actually before January, I'm, I'm, I don't know these things gonna happen. I thought she will give me the money, she will she will not have stolen. That's why I take my baby back from China. That's why it's like, uh, that's gonna be a <clears throat> little bit trouble for me because uh, right now I'm the single mother, so uh, I mean, I have to uh, have the, the way to make money to care of my family. I respect that, ma'am. And, yeah. and, what, and what I would suggest that you do is after the hearing, uh -huh. you can talk to someone from the city about how to reapply in, in the future if the vote goes through, okay? Okay. But thank you for, for your comments. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So the motion has been moved and seconded. And I'm assuming there's no further discussion, so I'll call it, call the vote. Is there, sorry, it's been a long night. <laughs> uh, all those voting in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries, thank you. May I ask one additional thing, not related to the motion? So if there are places where we can provide educational resources, um, it just for, for small business owners such as uh, the person we have today, I think that would be helpful. Just to let them, again, reinforce how to run a business um, and maintain compliance. So, you know, to do things, to follow the laws. I don't know if it's necessarily our responsibility. I mean, it, it, I think through this whole discussion, um, I, I'm trying to hit home the point that it's the business owner's responsibility to ensure they're complying with laws. And we wouldn't expect anything less from any other business um, in Moorhead uh, that needs to comply with the laws of the state and local government. So um, I think we're already spending it a whole lot of effort on this issue right now um, you know and so I guess you know just reiterating I'd like to maybe see what Mr. Shockley could come up with that might be discussion items for the council to try to get some some more teeth in our ordinance per se. 
And I'll say the reason I bring it up is really beyond this, that as we look at expanding small businesses in, in our community, um, there are, you know, it's difficult to start a business no matter what, particularly when you have language and cultural barriers and things like that. And so, um, and maybe this is something this, again, working with our, um, you know, uh, local business groups and, and EDA for those types of things, they can help work collaboratively. I think this, th there's a lot more going on in this particular circumstance than, uh, than is just simply, I think, um, some of those barriers, but I think that it, 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 I think it's important to touch on. I didn't want to leave this moment without bringing that up, that if there are places that we can provide, even if, again, it's working collaboratively, so that we can perhaps bring some of those businesses and help make them be successful in our community, so. Well, thank you for your comments, Councilmember White. Okay. Uh, agenda item number 16. Uh, oh. Sorry. Uh, actions related to the sale of city owned land. A portion of 1328 Main Avenue to Norris Division LLC doing business as Harold's Bar. Mr. LaPointe. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and uh, pretty simple one in front of you here today. There's a uh, a small portion uh, on the on the mayor and council communications, you'll see a kind of hashed out blue area. It's a, about a 25 by 90 foot parcel. Right now, it's just uh, it's dirt with a tree on it. Um, the the heralds on Main, the bar that just went in, had uh, requested uh, additional portions of land to kind of expand their outdoor seating area as well as some of the building code requirements. This uh, portion of property to the west, uh, owned by the city of Moorhead was acquired by uh, federal dollars, the CDBG funds. Um, there were certain requirements for the sale of that property. We did an appraisal where the, that, uh, that portion um, appraised at $4 a square foot. We have an agreement with the uh, Heralds on Main owners that that is an appropriate uh, amount. Uh, so what we're asking basically today, and, and we can kind of go through the lease details, but there's an amended lease that we'll go through with the new owners, which is Churches United. They've agreed upon it as well. Uh, but we'd be looking at a, a portion, again, 25 by 90 foot section on the east side of the city property being sold to uh, uh, Harold's on Main, uh, Norris subdivision uh, for a, approximately uh, $9,100. So uh, at this point, we don't see any issues with it and we're looking for approval from council tonight. I'll move approval. Thank you. Motion to approve. The, okay, so <clears throat> we're on letter A. Mm -hmm. So the motion to approve both, the resolution? Both. And B. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can do both? Good idea. So there's a motion to approve uh, 16 A and B, made by Councilmember Duran, seconded by Councilmember yes, Paulson. All in favor of said motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Mm -hmm. And then we move to item number 22, if I'm not mistaken, which is the resolution to approve the budget adjustment <clears throat> number 19-009 to transfer monies from the state drug seizures for the purchase of a canine dog and training with the canine dog and handler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Detloff, are you doing this one or is... <laughs> Police Chief <laughs> Shannon Murrow. Sorry, I could do it, but he'll do it better. <laughs> okay. Councilmember, while we're, has a question. while we're waiting for somebody to show up who gets, who gets to name the dog i had that was i don't it should be like a city maybe they like good the question kids in the know. schools or something wouldn't would be it nice? be a fun uh, content yeah i can do this agenda item if you want do you want me to do it <laughs> okay. but I, I am pretty sure they probably come with names already lieutenant Deltloff might be able to answer that you can do that I don't have the information on the exact uh, amount of money, but what, basically, essentially, what we're doing is, uh, Kane and Milo was retired here um, when Officer Brand, uh, Sergeant Brandon was promoted. 
Um, he would have been retired anyway at the end of the year due to age. We go for 10 years. Um, so we're looking to re replace um, his position. And originally we planned on doing that in 2020, but since we have an opening for a class this fall, um, it's actually going to be a pretty good deal for the city. They're, um, it's a smaller class, so it's more one-on-one -on -one training, which is going to cut four weeks off of the, the length of the training. They still get the same amount of training and stuff, um, but it eliminates uh, four weeks of hotel and per diem stays. It also um, puts them back on the street much quicker. So it's a base, I think it's five dogs they'll be trained at one time. Um, so just looking to, uh, we had some fundraising, overwhelming support actually. People wanted to donate more money. We'll look explore that when we replace um, K9 Argo, which is scheduled mm -hmm. in about two years. He's eight years old now. Um, and then we'll we'll look at raising more money for the next dog. But right now, just trying to get this all squared away for confirming the position in the class this September uh, with uh, Precision Kennels. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing about the money, so we've received two sets of donations. One, 5000 has been sitting there for a while. And then the Giving, or giving Hearts Day. Giving Hearts Day, or the... It was the uh, Fargo-Moorhead Community Coal or Coalition or something. They, yeah. they did fundraising oh. before Giving mm -hmm. Hearts Day. Exactly. Uh, for is. a number of different organizations with a $5,000 so cap hundred. on that. Thank right. you. Two That's seven, correct. Five, so we have 10000 total for that. We have seizure money we're going to use for the rest of it. Lieutenant Detloff is right. This was a great opportunity. We did reserve our spot, hoping that you would approve this. Usually this kind of item is on consent, but we just wanted to celebrate the fact that we do have a lot of um, community support for this, and it's pretty fun to get a new canine. And then Lieutenant Detloff, they asked who, who names a dog. Do you know? Um, so typically our dogs come with names. Okay. They can they can get renamed. Mm -hmm. I know Fargo has done contests on Facebook and stuff to generate interest and stuff. Um, they ended up with a canine named Blue uh, based off that little contest. So you can retrain Yay. them. Um, mm -hmm. Our dogs typically come from Czechoslovakia because the English bloodlines are not as clean as the foreign bloodlines. So the English bloodlines are uh, prone to hip dysplasia, which is really debilitating to the dogs. Uh, you might get three or four years from them. Uh, it's expensive to test them to see if it's there because you've got to wait till they're a certain age for the hips to develop. And usually by then you already have that bond with the dog before um, being able to determine that if they do have hip dysplasia, then what do you do? So the bloodlines in the European bloodlines are much cleaner. Um, another interesting note with our canine history, only two of our former canine handlers have left due to retirement. All the other previous canine handlers, um, <laughs> Deputy Chief uh, Jacobson, Lieutenant Carey, myself, uh, Detective Stuvlin, Sergeant Brannon, uh, Officer Files, and Detective Vogel have all been previous canine handlers. We're all still here with the department. So when we select them, um, we select basically the best of the best. It is a, a rewarding uh, career or, or opportunity for our officers to do. I expect a lot of interest for it, but if you guys want us to do a, a naming contest, we certainly could <laughs> do that. But right. Hmm. So my, my canine was named Rowdy. His Czechoslovakian yes. name was Ergo. So there are times when it got so excited that I would have to use a Czechoslovakian <laughs> name and a Czechoslovakian command in order to get him back into um, what he was doing because English was a second language and he wasn't real <laughs> um, comfortable with it when it was a high stress situation. So probably more than what you wanted to hear. No, great information. Thanks, Mike. Council Member Duran. You see, now, I, now I'm all excited talking about dogs. Um, I, uh, how old are the dogs when you when you get them? So we get them between nine months and a year and a half, okay. um, so that we can try to get about eight years of service okay. from them. So they've had a year of Czechoslovakian then. Generally, so, yes. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Chief, I don't know if you have anything to add at this point. He did a great job. You got the information you were Get. And when you leave the building, you get locked out of the building, so I found that out. So, <laughs> uh, so I apologize for holding you up on already a long night. But uh, did, did uh, Lieutenant Detloff cover the financial stuff and stuff on it already? Got so that covered, yes. Then you got it covered. So Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Oh, I wanted to. Oh. <laughs>
Motion to approve, <laughs> made by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member Watson Curry. <laughs> All in favor of said motion, please signify your vote by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> Yay. Uh, item number 25. Oh, I'm sorry, that's on consent. I think mm -hmm. I wear my glasses here. <laughs> number 28. Mayor and Council reports. Mm -hmm. Are there any reports? I have two really brief ones. So the uh, Clay County Collaborative uh, is still working on the longest table event. Thank you for the, the letter of support that we had from our city manager and from the mayor. Fortunately, we didn't get the West Central Initiative grant, but they are looking for other, other funding. And the other thing that I'll report is at our Human Rights Commission meeting, we followed up again on some of the recommendations that we had, we had um, voted on some recommendations that were gonna come to council but actually, when our city staff person, uh, Josh Huffman, looked into it, it was unnecessary. And so I said I would just inform the council of what those recommendations were. And one of them was to look at the current training that we have for landlords and um, look at ways of making sure that they are educating landlords about um, how to be in compliance with state and federal laws on um, on uh, avoiding discrimination in housing. And we actually already have that. And he spoke with Leanne Wallen and she was, um, she confirmed what they already have in there and actually may even use this as an example in some of the education that she's doing. So it was a great conversation. And um, we also, uh, he also looked at what they have on the web. And so we do also provide this information on the web. But again, it was just a good reminder that we, of the um, ways in which we can help educate landlords to make sure that they are in compliance. Cool. Thank you, Council Member White, for that. Any other reports? Uh, the only thing I'll follow up on real briefly is this, the current state of emergency. Uh, kudos to the team for putting it together uh, earlier uh, last week. It seems like the days are becoming a blur. Uh, Governor Waltz was in town today to show support for our community. A big thank you to him and also his staff out of St. Paul. Uh, that's probably all I'll say for right now for the good of the order. Uh, city manager reports, Madam City Manager Volkers. No report. Okay. That moves us to item number 30, executive session. Executive closed session pursuant to Minnesota Statute 13B.05, subdivision 3B, for the purposes of attorney client consultation regarding potential modifications to the lease agreement for the property described as lots three and four Block one with the Mighty Ducks addition. So for, for those of you at home, there's only 31 new business and 32 citizens addressing the council. There are no citizens remaining to address the council. Feel free to tune out and uh, we'll move into executive session. Is there a motion to do so? Second. Motion made by council member White, seconded by council member Paulson. All in favor of same motion, please signify by saying aye. All opposed, same sign. We are now in executive session. Thank you, everyone.